The Honorable the President. Let us pray. Almighty God, we willingly acknowledge you as a supreme being, most gracious and most merciful. Look down, we beseech you on us who are members of this Senate and deign to assist us in the duties that we have to perform on behalf of our beloved country of Trinidad and Tobago. Open our eyes to see the truth and help us to accept it with all its implications into our lives. Direct us, O Lord, in our deliberations so that setting aside private interests unwholesome prejudices and personal affections, we may treat all matters set before us with honesty, courage, and conviction. Through all we say and do in this Senate, may we give glory and honor to your holy name, inspire confidence in our fellow citizens, and make a positive contribution to the peace and prosperity of our nation. Amen. Announcements by the President. Petitions, papers, questions on notice. Motions relating to the business or sittings of the Senate and moved by a Minister. Need of Government Business. Thank you very much, Madam President. Madam President, having regard to the correspondence from the Speaker of the House in relation to the establishment of a joint select committee to consider and report on the gaming Gaming and Betting Control Bill 2016, and that this committee adopt the work of the Joint Select Committee appointed in the third session 11 Parliament and to report by December 31st, 2018. I beg to move that the Senate concur with the House of Representatives in the establishment of the committee and that the following six senators be appointed to serve. Ms. Alison West, Mr. Robert Luhunt, Mr. Foster Cummins, Mr. Wade Mark, Ms. Melissa Ramke Soon, and Mr. Paul Richards. Honorable Senators, the question is that the Senate concur with the House of Representatives in relation to the establishment of a joint select committee to consider and report on the gambling, gaming and betting control bill 2016, and that this committee be mandated to adopt the work of the joint select committee appointed in the third session, 11th Parliament, and report by December the 31st, 2018, and that the following six senators be appointed to serve. Ms. Alison West, Mr. Robert Lehunt, Mr. Foster Cummings, Mr. Wade Mark, Ms. Melissa Ramkisoon, Mr. Paul Richards. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Public business, government business, bills second reading. Honorable members, the debate on the second reading of the following bill, which was in progress when the Senate adjourned on Friday, October the 19th, 2018, will be resumed. A bill entitled, An Act to Provide for the Service of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial year ending on the 30th day of September, 2019. Senator Amin. Madam President, it is really with a heavy heart and against my conscience as a person and as a member of Parliament, of this Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago, that I rise to be a part, and I am a part of the convening of this Senate. In my humble view, given the disaster that we are facing in Trinidad and Tobago at this time, the government, the prime minister, should today have activated a national disaster response and declared today as a day for all citizens to join in cleaning up and rescuing Trinidad and Tobago and citizens affected. 
over the past three days, our country and our people have experienced a level of disaster that most have never, ever experienced before. And it is truly heartbreaking and heart-wrenching when you see what has happened in some parts of our country. I was on the field. I was in boats. I was in trucks. I was in my boots. I met the prime minister and a couple of government ministers. And they were on the dry land, on the road. They were not in the flood waters, Madam President. And I feel that if they had done that, they would have better been able to know the extent of flooding facing Trinidad and Tobago. And they would have declared this disaster a national disaster and responded to it. The flooding that has occurred was predicted more than a week ago. In fact, Madam President, the ODPM has is indicated that the warning is in place until tomorrow, Tuesday. And we are sitting here dry in the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago instead of being out there with the people, the citizens of this country. In This government, I know, will offer excuses. They will manufacture public relations. But at the end of the day, the responsibility to have prepared our country and all the agencies to deal with what took place over the last three days falls at the feet of the government. And this government has failed Trinidad. Madam President, this is, not, this is not an earthquake that could not have been predicted. This is a situation that we had days of warning, and they took no steps to do anything. I don't know if they thought they could, have, they, could have, they could have just ride it out and figure that it's a little rain that will fall, and only the people who are living in the lagoon would get flood, as one of their government ministers said some time ago. But thousands, in fact, this morning the news, they said over 100,000 persons are suffering. And they are suffering because of the failure of your this government. <laughs> Madam President, this government has, through its ministers, made statements to try to convince the population that the catastrophic devastation that we have experienced over the last few days could not have been predicted. They will tell you that the rains were unexpected, but we know that is simply not the truth. This was predicted that they knew what we were about to face. If things had been different, the level of loss and devastation could have prevented, for all we know. And what we do know now is that despite the warnings from the experts that the rains were coming, this government did nothing to protect the citizens of the country. <laughs> Madam President, it is not only about the past week when the weather warnings came. Because despite calls from regional corporations and local government councillors for drains and waterways to be cleared and clean, over the past three years, for rivers to be dredged and to be cleared of de debris, they did nothing. <laughs> No one, Madam President, can predict the, the, the force of Mother Nature. But you see the rainfall we had over the last few days? It, we, there, there really was no cause for us to have the level of destruction that we experienced. What the last three days has shown is that this country, under this government, led by this prime minister, will be completely destroyed, God forbid, if we experience this or any kind of natural disaster. The government will not want to admit it, but what we have experienced over the last three days, Madam President, is the result of three years of neglect, three years of incompetence, three years of abandonment, three years of sleeping on the job by this government. What we have seen is the result of three years of failure. 
And unfortunately, they say you have to burn to learn. And over the past three days, the people who have been flooded out have been flooded out to learn. But it is not that the government, it's not the government who is burning. It is Trinidad and Tobago that is burning. Madam President, unlike many of the members opposite, I have been on the ground. I have been assisting in rescuing people, children, elderly, dif disabled persons over the last three days. I have been on the trucks delivering relief supplies in homes, assisting with shoveling inches of slush where people have to throw out every single belonging in their home. Many would have been in the comfort of their home, but they didn't even, Madam President, see it fit to go in and join citizens to see the devastation firsthand. Madam President, one little capsule I want to share with this parliament. I went to Greenville and I met the Prime Minister on the dry road in La Hoketa, looking on at the floods. I was out there earlier. When I met him, it was when I came back from being out there with the Coast Guard in the floodwaters. I went with a family knee deep in water in their homes. Big people, big man, crying long tears because they lost everything. And Madam President, I feel that if you see that devastation firsthand, you will have a different impression than what this government is, has, has been having. People who have lost all they had, people who work all their life to build, in Greenville in particular, where you have people who have new homes. Many of their items are on higher purchase. Their mortgages still have to be paid at the end of this month. Is HDC going to forgive their mortgage? Is HDC going to completely repair their home and replace all the lost items? Pay off courts for their furniture? Those who have had a comfortable home to rest their head from Friday night woke up to the reality of not knowing where they would rest their head on Saturday. And the Prime Minister and this government says it's business as usual, back to school, back to work, no sense of the reality that is facing us. I don't know if the Honorable Prime Minister saw people on their rooftops who spend the night there begging to be rescued. People with six and seven feet of water in their homes, all their belongings destroyed. Children without food and water. Families without a roof over their head. People weeping because of their loss. Business places and homes, Madam President, unfortunately, that were evacuated, were being looted by bandits. And I want to thank the police officers who responded to those calls in Greenville to secure people's homes. But when the response from the government is so callous, you really have to wonder, have you no compassion for the people of this nation? Uncaring. Are you only going to pretend to care in front of the cameras? I want to tell you that after the Prime Minister left Greenville and with a couple ministers, I heard that he was going to Orokun and I was very happy because I was there and I saw the devastation. But unfortunately, the ministers did not go into Orupun in the flood affected area. They stayed by the gas station in Piaco and spoke to the media. And then they, he left. They went to Sandy Grandi. They went by the triangle by the police station and spoke to the media and left. They stood on dry land and made decisions for people who were swamped in water. Uncaring. Totally uncaring. I want to tell you today that you cannot buy compassion. You cannot PR compassion. You cannot buy wanting to care for people. You cannot buy kindness. And that is the difference between you and us. Over the past three days,
days, Madam President, I have been on the field together with my political leader. We have not had the aid of the security forces at our disposal. And we had to go out there and help those in need. We had a shining example to follow. And that is why over the past three days, the United National Congress really proved to this country that when you needed us most, we were there for you. Everything, everything that we have done is with volunteers, it is with donations, and private citizens assisting, and us putting on our boots and having all hands on deck. Ironically, the government, the prime minister, could activate a national disaster response that would put the military in charge of certain operations so that the coordination of all the volunteers, all the regional corporations, and all the government resources could be better organized. And they have failed to do that. From Friday night, the Honorable Kamala Pasad Bisesa instructed every member of our party to join hands and go out there in the rains and the flood, to put God first and do what you could to help those in need. On Friday night, while we were sitting here in Parliament, a plan was developed to go into every community and every home that was in danger and rescue those citizens in need. Our supporters were told to open their doors and homes to any and everyone in need and truly prove that you are your brother's keeper. All of our supporters, all of our citizens were mandated to come out and help and do all they could to bring relief to whoever was in need. And over the past few days, Madam President, above all the flood and above all the rain, we have witnessed the force of the rising sun rise to the occasion when our country and our people needed us most. I want to thank everyone who for the past few days who have risked life and limb in the devastating floods to help those in need. And to whoever is the member on the other side who stoops, that is your response to Trinidad and Tobago. That is how you feel about Trinidad and Tobago. Total disrespect. You do not deserve to sit in this parliament to represent Trinidad and Tobago because you stoops at the devastation of the people of this country. When your prime minister and your government failed you, Trinidad and Tobago, our people as citizens came together to rescue you. We will continue to be out on the field in the floods and on the ground to make sure that we do all that is possible to help those who literally cannot help themselves at this time. Madam President, when you see the devastation, when you put yourself in the shoes of the affected, it is depressing. It is depressing. The outpouring of generosity and charity not from the government, from the people, have been overwhelming. And I want to encourage every citizen, every church, every NGO, corporate Trinidad and Tobago, to continue to join us, to do the work that this government has failed. Yesterday, I was in Oropun. In the, on Saturday, we were in Oropun. There were HDC water trucks driving around, but they couldn't do anything. On Sunday, when I expected that the water trucks would help with the cleanup, they were nowhere around. The churches came out. Faith Assembly in Five Rivers, the Pentecostal churches, the Seventh-day Adventists yes. came out to give their labor, to get their hands and feet dirty. And they were there with shovels, shovel, shoveling mounds of slush from people's homes helping people take out couch and mattresses with brooms. And you know what? Unfortunately also, Madam President, because the wasser filtration system has been challenged by the dirty waters in the waterways, many areas, wasser had to cut the water supplies. So in Oropun and many other areas, they had no water in their pipes 
to help wash down. Where is minister? We were there, Madam President, providing bleach and sanitation chemicals, mops and brooms, but there was no water. And thankfully, there were contractors who came with water trucks to help, and HGC did come in the afternoon after lunch to start to wash down after quite a bit of the cleanup were done. But that is because the people of those communities band together to make sure that the affected were cared for. Food, clothing, hampers, water, mattresses, essential supplies have all been donated. And on, do, on behalf of those who do not have the ability that I do now to speak to Trinidad and Tobago through this parliament, I want to say Trinidad and Tobago, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who have given and continue to give. Please do not stop. Every single UNC MP, senator, councillor have been over the past days on the ground helping, but what is noticeable is the absence of the government ministers and the government agencies. Where were you? Do you know, all know and even have the ability to comprehend what, have happened, what has happened to our country over the past few days? And when I ask where were you, I'm not asking because I see you on TV having a press conference, yeah? But we are out there in the devastation and we are not meeting you on the ground. And the, the uh, he's a minister of quite a few things, but one of his, sorry. I'm trying to remember the portfolio, but one of it is communications and public relations. And he has been complaining of, of social media posts. Mm -hmm. Please, if you're making reference to a minister, I ask you to do it in the manner that is in the standing orders, please. This is communications, the Minister of Communications, Madam President, who is responsible for the public relations of the government has been complaining about social media and people posting on social media. And I want to thank God for the people of this country and social media that we know the reality of the situation. Yes. Up to this morning, Madam President, there was a, an Imam's son from Point Fortin who contacted Senator Tahaka Obika, who wanted to send a truckload of relief supplies. But because of what is being um, put out by the government and ministers and so on. They were under the impression that things are under control yeah. and they were not sure if they still send their supplies. And I want to say Trinidad and Tobago, we are not out of danger yet. Please continue to send your relief items and stuff. Today, Madam President, in spite of what the Prime Minister, the Honorable Prime Minister has declared, and this government has declared, it is not business as usual. No. I want to say that many schools were open, business places were open, but people could not get to their schools and business places. Many children, many students lost all their books, their uniform and shoes in the devastation. Even if their school was not uh, flooded they cannot go to school. Madam President, I want to make an open call to the public today, to the leader of government business, to shut down this debate for the next three days and let every member of parliament go out on the field and help the people of Trinidad. I want to urge you, the members of, on the other side, to join us, get on the ground, to give a helping hand to the thousands of citizens that we all collectively represent, and to help them because they need our help. You are in government. You have the resources. And our people need us now more than before. The rains are predicted to come again. And I don't want us to make the same mistake that you made last week. The weather, adverse weather advisory from the ODPM indicates that it remains in effect until tomorrow, Tuesday. 
There are people in our country who don't have food as we speak. They have no medication. In fact, some of our doctors, Dr. Rai Ragbir, and other volunteers, medical personnel nurses, have been out there. Pharmaceutical companies have been giving drugs and, and medical supplies for them to, as they volunteer at different shelters, to assist people in need of medical aid. People who have been injured in the flood, people who have had their feet damaged, people who are diabetic and hypertensive. And because of the trauma that they face, they need immediate medical attention and counseling as well. And I want to ask those who are in the medical field to continue to volunteer whatever time you can spare, um, even people who are in counseling, because I, I, I had the experience of taking a child out, she must have been about two or three in, in um, Greenvale. And, and when you take a child out of that traumatic experience, they can't speak. And people who have experience in counseling, uh, people who have experience in counseling would give, could give, um, could help us to assist those children and so on. So I want to urge you to come to the shelters, come to um, the various affected areas so that we could help people to cope. Um, Madam President, uh, I think really it is more important for us to be out there helping people and to be there. Um, this government, if you really do care, you, you have um, put yourself, you have given yourself a tag of being a caring government. Today, I urge you, let Trinidad and Tobago see how much you really care. Today, let us see if all the talk, or if, if it's all talk, or if you are really ready to do something for the people of our country. Today, Madam President, I make a call to the government to join us out there with the people of our country. Every member of the United National Congress will be on the field assisting those in need. You are invited to join us. The choice is yours. We will be on the ground. Let Trinidad and Tobago see where you are, where you will be. And if you are really ready to prove to this country that after three days of devastation and catastrophic disaster, the hardship and immeasurable suffering inflicted upon us, Madam President, if it is really business as usual. Madam President, I want to give way to the leader of government business. If he could, at this time, indicate if he is willing for this Senate to make a decision to go out there and help Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> The answer is that the Senate will continue to sit. Oh, my gosh. I can't believe that. Uh, I cannot believe that. Madam President, I thank the minister. I thank the minister who um, was also minister of energy, who was also a minister of local government at, and rural development at one time. And I want to say to this house, Madam President, I respectfully cannot sit and continue to be part of this sitting. I cannot. I cannot, I cannot in good conscience, as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, decide to participate in this exercise. Madam President, as a patriot and a national of Trinidad and Tobago, Madam President, I respectfully not be participating further in this debate, and I thank you. Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. Madam President, thank you very much for allowing me to enter into this debate at this time on an act to provide for the service of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial year ending 30th day of September 2019. Madam President, I am in Tong Long, not this morning, I just arrived in this city, but I'm around a long time now. Yesterday, I had the privilege, Madam President, of spending seven hours on a truck with three gentlemen who I had to say at the end of the seven hours to them that I have not worked with three Trinidadians as professional, as calm, and as brilliant as they are. Their names, Madam President, are Andrew Ramlogan, who drove, drove 
the hire truck, Mahindra Lal Gobin, a dispatcher, and Rashid Mohammed, a lorry loader. They were driving a Princess Town Regional Corporation truck, and they are employed by the Princess Town. They came to my part of the country, Madam President, Mayaro, to assist. Because we were under tremendous pressure, not for the first time. We've had since November 2015 five similar experiences. And one thing this country knows, that when there is an issue in Mayaro, I am there with the people of Mayaro. And wherever else in the country I have to be. And as this Senate, I am a senator and a legislator. My responsibility to this Senate is as equal to my responsibility to anybody outside the Senate. And when we closed at 8 p.m., I had my people in, in my area organized during the day. The technology allows us to do that. And a good leader has their hands on every, every angle of the job and the duty. And as I left the Senate on Friday, I changed my clothes. And I was on the streets in Mayaro. And I only left to return to this part of my duty, which I treat as equally as all the other aspects. And I will not stand. You could disrespect me and tell me I was home in the dry. That is no problem. But you see the three men from Princess Town who left their families yesterday, do not disrespect them. Andrew Ram Logan, Mahindra Lal Gobin, and Rashid Mohammed. And Madam President, as a proud Southerner, those gentlemen from Princess Town with resources attached to Princess Town brought donations from Naparima College in San Fernando, from Naparima Old Boys in San Fernando, and from citizens of San Fernando up to my Mayaro. And we were able to distribute it to everybody who needed it. Madam President, going into flood waters with kayaks and pirogues is not for everybody. I have colleagues here that I do not want with me in flood. And I have colleagues here and outside of here who I want with me in flood. And in every team, the responsibilities are different. Precisely. I will go in the water, but there are colleagues who I will not send in the water, but I'll gladly Make use of them because they have contacts in the business community, like my colleague Paula Gopiscoon, who from Friday night was begging us to take mattresses and distribute them to the person in the government. I cannot, for seven hours, Madam President, yesterday, my phone was off. I was nowhere near a charger or anything like that. But I had a colleague in the government getting on to answer my call for a million dollar donation. From early Saturday morning, I had a colleague sitting on this bench who got on to five energy companies who all made pledges, not to my community alone, but to this country. This is, this is me operating on I had a colleague sitting on this bench. I have a colleague sitting on this bench, Madam President who was able to tell me yesterday when my phone was back on that the government of Guyana wants to get in contact with me to find out what we need in agriculture, what agriculture supplies are going to be short, and how that could be coordinated. And I heard this morning from that colleague on this bench, Madam President, who is doing the people's work sitting right here. That Minister Joe Harmon from Guyana has been in touch with the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. Not everybody will go into a kayak with a parcel of goods for somebody. Somebody has to be talking to the donors for the goods. And somebody has to be coordinating the transport. And somebody has to be manning the phones, Madam President. So that the people out there, not for gallery, yeah. there are people here to do the people's work, and there are people out there who we work with, and the work will continue while we do the work of the Senate. It is extremely disrespectful. I, Madam President, I don't know about the others, I don't know where they were. Oh, no, the team out there. 
But I worked with members of the Defense Force from the time I left the Senate on Friday, and I journeyed through the country to deal with farmers first, and I then got to my hometown. And I have not stopped seeing members of the Defense Force. I know because we fed them up to last night. I have not seen members of the Coast Guard. I have not stopped seeing them. Madam President, I personally, personally, using our ministry's resources, ferried emergency medical cases to the Mayaro Health Center. And when the staff there had to leave to change their shift, ferried them out and picked up new people. The health system was working. And I cannot think, I was in Mayaro yesterday, standing next to Mr. Wint. I am a big critic of the ODPM and Mr. Wint. And I stood next to Mr. Wint on one side, Minister Young on this side, and Minister Kazim Hussein in front of me, all coordinating and getting the people's work done. And for Granville, there were ministers, mm -hmm. MPs, MP Ansel Antoine. Mm -hmm. There were local government councillors yeah. on all sides. Camille. In my community, there were UNC councillors, as there were PNM councillors. When you give a sick person some medication, Madam President, you don't say to them it's brought by exactly. or on behalf of. You do the people's business, mm -hmm. and you gallery later down the road. But today is not the day for that sort of behavior. Every finger that could be lifted in this country has been lifted in the last few days. And Trinidadians and Tobagonians no matter the old talk. Responded. In fact, Madam President, the response sometimes was too excessive for me. I had to tell people, don't block the street, don't block the road. We have enough people helping. Yesterday we had too much food. Mm -hmm. I had to tell people, save it for a day later on. We cannot, as a country, for the sake of some kind of political mileage on a Monday morning, diminish the sheer human response that took place, not only in this one, but all the ones that have been through it all, all that went before. We cannot diminish it because we have chosen to allow some of our colleagues who are in the other place to be outside there while we take the business of the budget forward. We have to get money. The Madam President, the there are two senators that I thought I should respond to. The first is Senator Shri Kisun. In a very balanced contribution that I really enjoyed and appreciated. And when Senator Shri Kisun pointed to the fact that with all he believes has been happening in agriculture, he had not seen this quantum leap. I turned to my colleague, Senator Singh, and I said to him, remember to tell him how about the weather. Because the fact is, Madam President, this government came in in 2015. And by 2016, we had to deal with the first set of terrible weather. November into December 2016, we had to deal with bad weather across the country, particularly in the Matlot area. And Matlot and the people of Matlot have not recovered from that as yet. It was unprecedented wind and weather damage from which they've not recovered. And from what I've seen of what has happened in Matlot this time around, it's a continuation of that. The ferocious water, the amount of water dumped in Matlot November 2016 December 2016 was unprecedented. 
and the water cut its way through the mountains and where you had water draining in, in little streams, you had big rivers opening, bringing down large rocks and destroying farmers, farms, and roadways. 2017, we came here in the media review to ask the parliament to authorize to the Ministry of Agriculture an increase, an increase that will allow us to fund the flood assistance to farmers and pay the subsidies and incentives and other forms of support that we had to pay, which were unprecedented. Madam President, Brett was devastating across the country. And the point is that what a lot of people, and I believe Senator Shriki soon should know, when this amount of rainfall gets into farmland, there are a mul there is a multitude of consequences. As simple as that topsoil that farmers, and my colleague will bear me out, that topsoil that farmers spend tremendous resources enriching. In the case of Orange Grove, in the case of all those former Karani lands that are not by its nature fertile, Farmers use limestone and other things to bring it up to a level of fertility. And when that level of water falls and moves, it moves topsoil, it moves limestone, and it sets the farmer back tremendously. Madam President, I am, I've been in the midst of working with the ministry to prepare communication on giant African snail. Last week, I was out in a part of this city that I never thought would see giant African snail. A giant African snail is not just something that looks very repulsive, but it carries and it is capable of carrying meningitis. And if handled with the bare hands, there are severe consequences. Madam President, I want to tell this country that I am more concerned about the impact of giant African snails flowing with floodwaters throughout the country that I am concerned about roads and bridges and helicopters. That, to me, is one of the most severe consequences. Because giant African snail was only in Dego Martin. And when, the floods, when we had the flood issue in Dego Martin, it spread from the single residence straight through Dego Martin. And every time I go about, Madam President, and this country knows that I go personally when there is a major issue, minor issue, an issue. Once I have the time, I go. And I see it for myself. And every time I go, as I went to urban port of Spain, I could not imagine. And the first question I asked, do you have a gardener? And the family said, yes. Did he bring soil? Yes. And that is how it, is trans it moves, by moving soil across the country. So it moved from Diego Martin to Orange Grove to Santa Cruz to Central Trinidad, to Holy Faith Convent, down by my colleague, Pastor Cummins, who called me to respond, to Holy Faith Convent in Coover, to Taruba. But this flood water that has hit Orange Grove, not just the losses relating to food, but the potential for a significant spread of giant African snail. And none of my colleagues sitting on this bench, Madam President, could help me deal with that. Even they were, if, if they wanted to go out there with me, I would not carry not one of them. I'll say, stay right here and debate all day. We have to deal with that. And the spread of diseases, the spread of pests, as soil move, when you, when you disrupt and when you move, the farmers will face a tremendous, and with breath, I said, it is not just the immediate loss of the crops. It is the recovery time. And we are heading into the high season for the farmers. Diwali is one of the most productive times for them, followed by Christmas. And what would happen while the people are asking me about the food prices right away, the bigger issue is our ability to provide as we go down through to the end of the year. And that is why the government believed that the more important decision to make related to a conversation with Guyana and then, as the fields, as the water runs off, we understand what we have to do. 
But Madam President, this government did not sit down. When I was before the Standing Committee, I made a point, and this was the point. I said I'm thankful for my colleagues in both houses who approved the media review, the media supplement, because that, sub, that allocation gave me the opportunity. And I think the staff at the ministry has said to me, Minister, it is unprecedented that we've been able to clear almost all our debts by midnight 30th September 2018, because successful agriculture ministers have come in and have met, for example, flood assistance, six, seven million dollars in claims, unpaid, and an allocation for the new fiscal of two million. So you take your two, and you pay last year six, and you owe last year six, and you add this year seven, and it keeps adding up. And together with our permanent secretary, Lydia Jacobs, we took this decision that we were going to manage this and we managed to clear $53 million in debts to farmers. And in the standing committee, Madam President, I was asked on the allocation for subsidies and incentives, I was asked, why is it lower? I saw the 20, last fiscal, $34 million, and this fiscal, 24 And I said, that 34 includes the extraordinary supplementation that took place in the media review. But if you look what has been historically allocated, you will see 12. And what the government has done for this fiscal year under incentives and subsidies is to double it. So we have two positives under that one line item. We have no debt that we are bringing. We have the 12 million that we are accustomed to, and we have an additional 12 million for this fiscal year. I pointed to flood assistance, and I said we are coming in with almost zero claims. Any claim that come in now would have been some claim in some outlying office that did not reach. But unlike previous years, when the allocation for flood assistance was 2 million, we have been allocated this year $9 million. And if it is that this present issue causes us to pay out $9 million, that is what we have to do. And if we have to come back to the parliament or via through our own internal dealings in the ministry, we will do what we have to do. Madam President, I sent out information to the farmers since last week, as I all have always done advising about the three-day forecast for continuous rain. I also signal to the farming community that we as a ministry will put the resources in place to receive their claims for assistance from today. And last night I confirmed that a tent is being placed outside the ministry headquarters office in, Chag in Chaguanas for the purpose of putting in additional staff to receive these claims. So I don't know, Madam President, that I have to be out there yeah. now yeah. Yeah. carrying water mm -hmm. when I have done what I'm supposed to do on the ground. I've come here to account to the country, and I'm here to tell the farmers and the food producers in this country that we stand behind you on the basis of the allocation. That is what I'm here. Everybody, every farmer, every person that I represent will turn their televisions on at this time and say, that is Clarence. He just leave my arrow in a tall boots. And when Senator Tahaka Obika asked me if I changed my colors today, I tell him I grab what I could get that wasn't wet because I have a job just like every man and woman sitting on this bench and that bench. We have our responsibility. And we have the capacity to sit here, do the Senate's job, do the ministry's job, and do the job of every community that one of us represents. And I don't see a problem in being able to do that. 
So to Senator Shreepke, soon I, I say that. The reality is that the changing weather patterns, the intensity of the rainfall, the frequency of the rainfall, in fact, this was one of the best years the farmers were having. Because through the dry season, which is always a cry for water, we had rain, sufficient rain. Not enough to cause damage, but enough to keep water on the fields. And up until Friday, we did not have a rainfall event to set them back in the manner, but we had dry periods through the rainy season. And the production and the farmers were saying to me, they're doing well. And when this act of God takes place, then we have to respond. And we respond to budgetary allocations, through the work of ministers, permanent secretaries, staff, our ministry have staff. Madam President, there's a tractor operator called David, who I, don't, I hope he doesn't claim for all the hours. But there are parts of the country that only a tractor with a low trailer could move through to pick up people. You have somebody who is not well. We had to put somebody living room chair on, a, on the low trailer and put a pregnant lady to sit down on it to take to the hospital. You know this is not fantasy land with air ambulance and water ambulance, you know. This is reality. And you don't need a cape or a UNC flag to rescue people or to help people. I am amazed that anybody, I don't want, I don't want to be recognized. Everybody know. I don't want that. But do not, for nurses, security guards, army, police, coast guard, who made it through the floods, abandon their own needs. Municipal corporation workers, truck drivers, loaders, Ambulance drivers, telephone operators, supermarket workers, even the clergy. I went to church yesterday morning because I know when something is beyond me. I make sure that I went to church yesterday morning and my priest make it out of the flood to come and do what he has to do. And I'm sure across the country. In fact, Madam President, you know what I said yesterday morning around 10 o'clock? If some of these churches cancel the service, it will be better for us. Because the amount of people pack up in vehicles at the edge of the flood wanting to cross to go to the church. But that is the country we have everybody. And I will not, as a legislator, as a senator, as a minister, minister and a citizen, I will not let anybody diminish the work of the people of this country. Madam President, the other senator that I feel compelled to say something in response is Senator Ramkisun. I sat and I listened to her contribution. And I, under, I, I understand her position. She did not disclose her position. But her entire presentation was couched in the context of being a Petrochin employee. And she Senator Ramke soon talk about the best and the brightest and all of this in the country and people. Madam President, I don't know if I am mad. I don't know. I might be. But I was barely out of my 20s in an executive position in Carney 1975 Limited that allowed me the use of a company house, a company vehicle with a driver, long-term pension plan, medical, access to clinic and free medication, <coughs> salary, yeah, allowances. Nice. Yeah, nice. mm -hmm. and Madam President, when asked by the Pandey administration to opine on the future of the sugar industry, I gave the advice that I could give. And when asked by the Manning administration that followed, I gave the advice that I could give. 
And I ended up v sepping myself. And I was no youth man walking around without a part on a stick. I had wife and children, little ones. But I could not make a decision or give advice only considering my personal circumstances. I had to consider the greater interests of this country. And I stand behind my role on what ends up being the closure of the sugar industry in this country. And I don't know the goodness and greatness of any other citizen of this country. I have never been out of a day of income since that time. I've been able to work around the world. I was employed by two major multinationals, including the largest bank in the world. And when called upon again to play a role in this country's development, I quit that job and I came back here. And I went for 14 or 15 months without a salary because I wanted to serve this country in this parliament as a member of the PNM. And Madam President, I listened to my colleague, Senator Ramkisun. And my colleague offered no recommendation to deal with the bullet payment that is due next year, close to $5 billion. My colleague offered no recommendation to deal with the payment that follows. My colleague offered nothing except save the jobs in Petrochin. If I had done that in Karani, because Madam President, when I finally adjusted my position out of the sugar industry, I was interviewed by the Newsday about my decision to move to something else, not far from that. And I said, as a CEO, I have grave difficulty in running a company like this. And I said, I have four, four hurdles that I will never get over. The first one, because my colleague went into some basic information about the sugar industry. Well, I could give you the whole story. I said to the Newsday, I cannot run a business where the raw material to produce my final product, I have no control over the price or the quality. You with me, Senator Small? Because notwithstanding many years of Dr. Rankin studying this thing called payment by quality, where you pay cane farmers for their sugar cane based on the quality of, your, of their sucrose. We never implemented that. So we, and the people in the South know it better than the people in the North, we were paying for truck engine, car parts, train line, stove. Madam President, like you see with this flood? Cane farmers would have put all them discarded stove in the middle of the bundle of cane. Mm -hmm. Because you pay by weight. The cane is lifted by a crane, weighed, put onto the truck. And you don't know if that is John Cane, Jack Chain, or Jean Cane. And you pay for that. And what you get, you get. You get a whole mora tree in there. And you have to grind it and try to make sugar out of that. That's the first cent one. The second one, Madam President, was in the middle. When the cane get there and you cut it up, you're using a 100-year-old factory. Rank 126, 126 in the world in terms of efficiency. And for once, the higher the number is not the better the score. Mm -hmm. Making Karani 1975 Limited the world's Number 62 in efficiency as a sugar producer. 
in the middle there, notwithstanding the equipment, you could have the best equipment in there. You have in that factory five trade unions, each knocking on your door for an increase every three years. And it has nothing to do with productivity, profitability, efficiency, world market prices, or the future prospects of the business. So if you buy in stupidness, you're making stupidness, and you're selling stupidness, how could you continue? But every pipe, everybody come in with a cap for you to pay and pay and pay, and nobody want to work and work and work and improve and improve and improve. And then on the outside, you could produce the finest sugar, the best crystals. The world market was collapsing. From 1950, we had the Commonwealth Sugar Agreement that guaranteed us preferential prices. But as Thailand, Australia, and Brazil became big producers, because they were getting into the business. So the first thing Brazil do, the new factories were dual factories, making sugar when sugar prices were up, switching to ethanol when sugar prices were not attractive. And all the new factories that were commissioned, the fields that were planted were planted on flat land for the purpose of mechanized harvesting. We introduced harvesters in Trinidad, but we could only mechanically harvest the fields in the north which were flat. So when the prime minister get blows for saying that you need land for agriculture, that is what he meant, economies of scale. Economies of scale in these countries, there's an old joke from the US in these countries, they say a farmer, a farmer in the US could take a tractor and go down one line in his field and not stop until the day finish. That is what the prime minister is talking about, economies of scale. And when you look at Brazil, Brazil, where a worker could work for six cents US a day, the equivalent, compared to Trinidad, where you have to pay them and beg them to work. Brazil, Thailand went to the WTO and challenge the long-standing preferential prices for international sugar, not only sugar, beet. Where Europe, major beet producer, had, like us, been subsidizing their farmers and paying preferential prices. And that was falling apart. And the economy in Trinidad and Tobago was doing well enough to support the most lucrative visa package given to any worker in the country until that time, to now. And a big part of Karani was the money that was spent close to $20 million in transitioning workers, retraining workers, thousands of workers. You have people, Madam President, I did not read this, you know. I lived through this, all the way knowing that at a certain point in that program, I was going to make myself unemployed. But I did, as a citizen of this country, what I felt as a professional, given my experience, my expertise, and my knowledge of the international sugar and agriculture market on the whole, that I was best positioned to support the government in what it wanted to do. And when you come, come with your facts, come in to ask for facts without facts. Petrotrin, I don't want to go in into Petrotrin, except to say that even at a cursory glance, a business like that is not sustainable. Even in good times, it's not sustainable. Minister, you have five more minutes. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I understand the emotions. I am not devoid. I am not distanced from it. I understand it. As a matter of fact, Madam President, I could tell you that the first vacancy that came up in our ministry, there are certain positions, as you know, Madam President, which are personal to the minister. There are five of those. And one became available. And I reached out to a petrochain worker who was going home and hired that young lady. She has a master's degree in environment. And I said to her, 
I don't know what you'll do with your degree, but I have a spot and I want you to come and take it so that you could transition yourself. And if every employer, if everybody do that, we'd be able to assist and the government is committed and the new companies would hire and so on. But when I feel, not everybody is the same, I feel that when we come into this house, we come to represent the national interests and not our personal interests. Madam President, I just want to close by talking about land. Because as the flooding takes place, I always come back to land. The farmers who say to me all the time, Minister, if we have long-term leases, we will be able to do more to deal with climate change and all that, our country. And I've spoken about the paper and all of that. The parliamentary secretary has said that we've launched a land card that gives farmers access to their electronic files. Are we moving? We're doing 500 new files a, a month. And once we continue doing that, farmers would be able to come to the ministry with their card, have it read by a barcode reader, and all their information will appear. And a lot of things go with that platform that I cannot talk about now. But the fact is, Madam President, if there is a contribution I would like to make to this country and to the farming population, it would be in the area of securing their land tenure over the long term. And I have the backing of my colleagues who are here, who are out on the field, to the Prime Minister who leads this team in a most inspirational and inspired way. All of us are confident that we have the support of our Prime Minister. I'm proud to be in this government. I signed up to serve in this parliament. I'm here this morning to do the work of the parliament. And at the earliest opportunity, Madam President, my boots and tools are right outside. I'll make the change and go and serve the people in a different way. I thank you very much. Senator Richards. Good morning, colleagues. Thank you, Madam President, for recognizing me and affording me an opportunity to uh, contribute to, uh, on this morning, uh, to the bill and act to provide for the service of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial year ending on the 30th day of September 2019. And I will admit, from the onset, it is a challenging morning to be here, like all of us, I'm, I'm presuming. And it's, it's not only a challenging morning for us to be here, but I guess for every citizen in Trinidad and Tobago who feels for their fellow nationals, who, have, who has empathy for their fellow nationals to, to go out and do their work in their various capacities throughout Trinidad and Tobago. And, and I respect uh, everyone's perspective. The, the opposition senators, our colleagues, took a particular stance this morning. And they have the right to their opinion. But, but I'm of a, of a different view, and I think uh, we all have to make contributions in a country like this, especially when uh, natural disasters hit, when crises hit in our various capacities. And, and we will all understand that our capacities are different because we don't only serve in one capacity. Many of us serve in several capacities. You know, I have colleagues in, in the media house for which I'm employed and, and work who came out on Saturday and Sunday without hesitation because dissemination of information is important at a time like this. And, and colleagues in, in other media houses came out and people in other sectors came out because while people and, and hands and feet on the ground in the flood hit areas, in the devastated areas, are very important in those areas. There are other areas that provide support to those areas. And every, everything and everyone cannot be in the same area doing the same thing because the machine of state doesn't work like that. And we have to be cognizant of that. So while I respect uh, our colleagues' decision, I think because of the nature of this bill to provide for the service of Trinidad and Tobago, it may be even more critical for us to pass this for them. Because without the funds that this bill will generate, or will authorize, I should say, and even more so now, because I guess 
you know, one would have prepared, I know I prepared a particular presentation, but it has to be uh, amended to deal with that situation because we can't pretend it didn't happen. And by sitting here or standing here and making a contribution and, and a pers giving a perspective on this, it doesn't mean that I or any of us, I don't think, has abandoned our responsibility. And we have individual responsibilities to those people, our brothers and sisters in, in Greenvale, in Orpoon, in, in Karani, in, in Kelly, in, now in Maraval and some parts of Diego Martin and Sikura, I think it's incumbent upon us to understand that we have multiple rules. And this is one of them, I think, and I, I'm very proud to be able to stand here and make a presentation about this. And, and Madam President, I will tell you, crises and challenges really show the mettle of a people and of a nation. And I will tell you, I am extremely proud to be a national of this country, to be a Trinbegonian today. Because of what I have seen over the last weekend, our people have shown that they are compassionate, that they are willing to, to help at a moment's notice, are willing to give up themselves to sacrifice what they have when our brothers and sisters, our, our fellow nationals of Trinidad and Tobago, are in need. And I think uh, the people of Trinidad and Tobago need to be commended at this time for what they have shown over the last two, three days, and no doubt will continue to show in the coming weeks, because this is far from over. We've all seen the videos on, on traditional and social media of what has happened. I have myself never seen that kind of flooding and devastation. I've never seen houses and cars submerged on that scale. You, you know, I've seen flooding, but not like this. And I want to say thank you because, you know, in all of this, I have not heard of any loss of life. And I think we need to be thankful for that because in other parts of the world, this kind of flooding, there would have been loss of life. And I'm really thankful there was no loss of life and there, and, and there were one or two injuries and, and, and there are grave threats that are posed to people at this time because of sanitation and hygiene issues. But, you know, we have to give thanks for life. And I want to also thank uh, some sections of our society who have gone above and beyond the, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force, the Coast Guard, prisons, the, the members of the ODPM, the regional corporations, uh, the doctors, the nurses, the uh, teachers, schools, mosques, mandirs, churches, uh, colleagues in the media, colleagues in, in the business community, members of the government and members of the opposition all need to be commended because everyone went out and continues to go out. And, and you know, Madam President, through you, now is not a time for red or yellow, or brown, or white or green. Now is not a time for rich or poor, or upscale or lower scale. This is a time for Trinidad and Tobago. This is a time for all of us to realize that this has and will affect all of us. I don't think there's anybody in this August House or in Trinidad and Tobago who is not directly or indirectly or has not been affected by this. We all have families, friends, colleagues who live in, in Greenville, Oropoon, uh, uh, Sangre Grande, Kelly Village, Kearney, some parts of South Trinidad, uh, Marval. We all know someone who has been affected. So we all have to band together, heart, mind, soul, and, and put country first at this time. And I really want us to keep that in mind moving forward, because this is far from over. It is, it is far from over. I, I don't know what the overall plan is, because I, I, I really don't see how anyone can move back into those houses, particularly in Greenville. So I know the state is going to have to make a decision where that is concerned, the government. And, and fine, I know many people are in shelters at this time and, 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 and being lodged at, at family and friends. But certainly, that situation is not going to come to resolution anytime soon. And, and that is a relatively new community. And even the ones in San Grande and the parts of Kelly and Central Trinidad that were affected, that may not be as new as that. Those people need houses. Those children need school books. They need uh, supplies. They need everything. People have lost literally everything. So um, I'm asking, I'm begging Trinidad Tobago to Let's continue to show our generosity of spirit. And to me, this is what being a patriot is about.
football matches and cricket matches are great, and we could sell out the Brian Lara Stadium. But this is what being a real Trinidadian is about. And our, people, our, our brothers and sisters in Tobago also have been somewhat affected by this. So as I said, I'll try very hard to stick to as much as I prepared before, but it is particularly difficult under the circumstances. But I think it's also important to, to share perspectives on, on what has been presented by, by any other place, by Minister Imber and by our colleague, uh, Minister West, uh, on Friday. So with that said, you know, there are several other issues that have come up as a result of what has happened that, that we really need to consider in Trinidad Tobago moving forward. I mean, if, if anyone wants to stand up and pretend that climate change is not real, I, I think they have to be really living in a, a, a underground because we have not seen this kind of flooding. We have not seen this kind of instantaneous change in water flow. And, and some are saying, well, it's the spring tide situation that, that would have a, a, a confluence of, of different circumstances, higher than normal uh, tides coming, high tides, and two days of rainfall. But when we think about it, this is not a hurricane. This wasn't, as far as I know, a tropical storm. It was severe weather. But what would happen if we were to really have a Category 3 tropical uh, hurricane or a severe storm hovering over Trinidad Tobago mm -hmm. for 10 hours? Th these are lessons, th these are opportunities to learn and prepare. We have to look at environmental issues a lot more closely in Trinidad and Tobago. And we have not been doing that. We have to look at issues of structural integrity and building codes in Trinidad and Tobago and where we are building and where we have built for the last 40, 30 years. And if it is still sustainable to keep some housing developments in some areas. Because we, if we don't have these considerations and conversations now, we will be forever coming behind the curve to try to mitigate what is no doubt going to come again. This is not going to be an isolated event. It is going to happen again. We can be sure of that. We, we have to look at the, the issue of disaster relief, rescue relief, and, and rebuilding, and what we're allocating in budgets for that. Because now when we, when we think about it, our colleague, Minister Kazim Hussein, because of what has happened here, his budget allocation that, we, that, 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 that we're proposing here may have been wiped out. The, the, the allocation in this, in this bill for housing and, and what it says is, you know, and, and I'm quoting part of um, Minister Imber's contribution, we have to overcome the financial constraints to ensure we can improve the supply of housing to meet extraordinary demand. And this is before this. Because I think there are about four or 500 units in Greenville alone that have been got devastated. Uh, capacity building could deliver 6,000 housing units by 2012, and therefore 3,000 per annum. But this now has to be amended. Because we have now an even more urgent need for persons. Uh, and we all know of the backlog in HDC and, and, and the, the, the shortfalls in private sector housing developments. We have literally about 200 families now in need of basic housing at this stage, not even people who are on a list, who are living somewhere but on a list awaiting housing. So many of the, 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 the provisions in this bill have now to be given a second or third level of consideration because th these situations are now urgent and what I would consider emergency um, circumstances. So I'm hoping that you know, we can have a meeting of the minds regarding conversations moving forward of what we need to put in place as a country, especially to mitigate these kinds of circumstances. And, you know, it, it brings me to part of what I, I would have prepared uh, last year's budget statement was, was titled Changing the Paradigm, Putting the Economy on a Sustainable Path. And, and this year, uh, it's titled uh, Turnaround. And I know there's been a lot of debate as to whether there's a turnaround or not, different perspectives on what a turnaround means. And even if we had a turnaround, because of situations that we, as we witnessed in the last three days, we realize how easy it is for our projections to go awry. How easy it is for us to go behind the curve if we are turning around. 
you know? And I would have been more cautious because I'm conservative by nature and not said tightly turn around, but turning around, <laughs> you know? Because if we get two, three more like this, God forbid, it could have significant impact on, on our fiscal measures and projections moving forward because we would have to divert originally planned funds in some areas to others. In any case, Madam President, I think what we can all agree on is that the economy has been stabilized. Because whether or not one wants to contend with whether it's 1.9% growth or 1.2% growth or 1% or, or growth, there is a level of stability in the economy. And I think the government must be commended for that. Because if the economy had continued the decline or crashed, we would have a totally different conversation in Trinidad and Tobago. And I think, to start, let's give credit where credit is due. There has been some level of stabilization. And whether one wants to contend as to whether it's 1.9% growth or 0.8% growth, there is growth, which means there has been a, 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 a shunting of, of the deceleration or the decline of the economy from three, three years ago to where we're seeing a different trajectory now, which is very commendable. And I think uh, in light of uh, what we're seeing in some parts of the world, that needs to be commended. We, however, should not allow ourselves, Madam President, to be lulled into a false sense of security. Because although there have been gains made in the non-energy sector, we, we have realized how easy it is, because of the volatility in the Middle East and, and energy prices, how easy it is, though it's, it's around $60 a barrel US per oil and, 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 and the gas price is stabilized, with the shocks that are very easily, uh, that can easily happen in the energy industry, we could fly back to 30, although that's not a projection, $30 a barrel. Because when we, when we uh, encountered in, I think it's 2013, 2014, those shocks, they were not predicted. And yes, we, we're monitoring the geopolitical situation in the Middle East that, that have direct impact on, on energy prices globally. This is a very volatile global space, and, and we can't be lulled into a false sense of security. So I'm hoping that we look at, at, at real measures to diversify out, of, out of, of the energy sector. Because even when we are accounting for growth in the non-energy sector, it is still predicated on low electricity prices, subsidies still at some level to, to, to diesel and, 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 and premium gas and, and regular gas. So if, if, we, if we look at, at similar models existing in, 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 in other jurisdictions, our business models may not be as sustainable as we think, given the kind of subvention government still gives, even to the non-energy sector. And that needs to be accounted. Madam President, I am extremely happy in terms of the general allocations because of what it sends as a philosophical message. Because education and training at $7.392 billion has received the largest allocation in, in the budget. And I think that sends a message that the government understands the importance of the most important type of development, and that is human development in education and training. We have for many years, in two or three administrations, put the national security pie bigger than that. And I think we're finally starting to realize it's not necessarily more money going into national security. It's better arms of national security, better managed and more efficient and accountable national security uh, mechanisms that will make the difference. So national security is second with 6.12 billion, health at 5.695 billion. And I would suggest that, as I indicated before, because of the, what, what we've seen over the last couple of days, and, and the, the impact and implications for the, the flooding and the possible health hazards moving forward. Because over the next couple of days, as the water recedes, hopefully we'll get no more significant rainfall. There will be, or there are, eminent health issues looming. Because sewage has now been mixed with water supplies and People are going back into houses that have been inundated with all sorts of bacteria. Our colleague, Minister Ambarath, just indicated the issue related to the movement of soil from one area to the other with the, 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 the African snail, which is an extremely dangerous circumstance that we must consider. Because in, in other circumstances, touching a snail, the, the African snail, is one thing. 
physically, but when you have to wade through water where these snails have been moving around and the soil moves from one area to other, you don't necessarily have to directly touch the snail. You can be contaminated and get very, very ill in a moment's notice overnight. And, and these issues related to flooding now put additional burden on this 5.659 billion that has been allocated to healthcare. Works and transport will be directly affected because that north-south highway, I don't know how much structural damage has taken place. When you have that much water on a highway and, and the, 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 the soil levels have now been saturated and water moves above and below soil, we have to look at now checking the structural integrity of that extremely critical conduit between North and South Trinidad moving forward. And it may be that, that works and transport at 3.546 billion will, may have to be expanded or, or some projects uh, postponed to deal with this new eminent issue. All those areas, the Orpoon, the Greenvale, Sangue Grande, etc. I have seen at Maraval and, and parts of Diego Martin, I have seen roads significantly damaged. The, the uh, river burst its banks, the Maraval River, in the area of Shaconia, bringing uh, debris down and, and destroying people's foundations and, and parts of the, of the bridges and roads. So I, I'm not sure that those circumstances, Mr. Vice President, have been considered. Rural development and local government, 1.76 billion. And, and given the ongoing effects we will see due to climate change, I, may I suggest that rural development and local government, there needs to possibly be a revision of this number because of what now is afoot in terms of understanding the importance of local government and regional corporations in disaster management, in, 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 in intervention in these sorts of circumstances. I know uh, leader of government business in the Senate, Minister Khan, spoke in the last session about uh, legislation coming in this session in terms of uh, the, the local government bodies and, and what the government intends to do with it. I think it is even more critical now in terms of understanding local government is not what it was 20 years ago. It does not fulfill the same functions as it was 20 years ago, 10 years ago. It must now be expanded to be more holistic in terms of taking into account the effects of climate change and understanding that this is the main uh, mechanism through which the government offers assistance directly and coordinating efforts in terms of disaster relief in this country. Not to mention housing, uh, as I said before, and agriculture at $0.78 billion. And I, I, I really want to put on the record, I don't know how Minister Ambarath makes out. <laughs> I, well, there's prudent management, and I commend you for that. But you know, you've, 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 Minister Ambarath, I'm sorry, Mr. Vice President, has been able to do quite a lot with very little. But I don't really think and, 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 and I want to reference, and I really don't want, I'm hoping I'm not misquoting the Honorable Prime Minister, because it was a news report, and we know sometimes, let me stress sometimes, news reports can vary in terms of accuracy. Uh, but I think it was the Honorable Prime Minister's voice I heard who said that uh, we have to consider economies of scale and that agriculture, we never built to grow the kind of food we need in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, so agriculture, if, if I'm paraphrasing correctly, Putting more money into agriculture is what in my understanding of, of the Honorable Prime Minister's statement may not be as productive because of the economies of scale. And I think that's, a, that's not a very productive message, in my humble opinion, to send. Because I know we had the same land mass 62, 52, 55 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, but we seem to produce more. And everyone who understands modern, agricult modern agriculture and modern food production and modern fisheries knows that you don't need extremely large land spaces. In addition to the specialized area of, areas of agriculture that one can explore in the modern context, particularly with our history at the University of the West Indies, and the, 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 the exquisite and unique types of cocoa and other products we have in Trinidad, Tobago, scorpion peppers. We can make special interventions into agriculture, food production, and manufacturing that may not need large land spaces. But I think we need to telegraph, as we, as we would have decades ago, Mr. Vice President, that every home garden, every community garden, 
every farming plot that can be maximized should, because food production and agriculture is very, or are very important in any country as a national philosophy. So thinking that we can continue to import and pay five plus billion dollars in primarily stuff we don't need to keep a particular section wealthy, to me is not a productive way to go. We have to do better than that. We have to think that we can grow more and produce more food and generate more farming income in Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Vice President, let me go to the specific areas that I want to uh, elucidate. Let me start with national security. And uh, the Minister of National Security, uh, if I can ask Mr. Vice President, how much time do I have left? Sorry? At 11.47. Okay, I have 17 minutes. I have a lot to get through. All right. The Minister of National Security uh, spoke a lot uh, last week, Friday, in his presentation about fire services, lifeguards, uh, the, the interventions in the budget for the TT Police Service, CCTV cameras, which I can't be, uh, the, the, the issue of the firearm users' licenses for prison officers in a keep and carry protocol. And, and the changes being made in the TNT police service, you know, and, and fines and penalties for officers who are complicit in terms of legislation will face greater, greater sanctions and Coast Guard radio system to improve protection of borders. However, Mr. Vice President, you know, I had the honor, and I think the, the interim report has been laid to, to, to tour several of the, the uh, Port of Port of Spain areas. And we, Coast Guard strengthening of the border patrol is one thing. But most, a lot of the contraband that comes into the country doesn't need to go through the coast, you know. It's coming in right in Port of Spain right here. And until we deal with the corrupt officers who facilitate that, no matter how much Coast Guard strengthening or coastal strengthening we do, it's going to amount to no, because they're using so-called legitimate uh, mechanisms to bring contraband into the country. You know, let me put on record also, Madam President, my congratulations to the government on, to me, what is one of the most potent and significant moves to bolster, bolster national security in Trinidad and Tobago, and that is the appointment of Mr. Guy Griffith. And I think that move alone has already started to bear fruit and will be one of the, the most significant moves in terms of uh, strengthening national security and fighting crime in Trinidad and Tobago. And we've seen the changes he's already making. We've seen him on the ground in the last couple of days. And, and one of the reason why, reasons why, Mr. Vice President, I am happy that Mr. Griffith has been appointed com Commissioner of Police is because he's not of the police service. It is because I believe the biggest challenge facing the police service is corrupt officers. And if and until we strengthen the Police Complaints Authority and widen its leg legislative ambit to deal with those officers, as great as I think Mr. Griffith can perform, it will be thwarted by those corrupt elements of the police service, who quite frankly, in articulations to the Police Service uh, and Welfare Association, articulated in, in the debate to confirm Mr. Griffith their, their dissatisfaction with the choice because they wanted the status quo to remain, because there's the blue wall of silence and colleagues protect colleagues. So I'm glad that Mr. Griffith is in place now, and I think one of his most urgent missions is really to clean up the police service. Because no matter how much progress you made, those officers have information and access to information that continues to damage the credibility of the TT police service. So part of what, one of the allocations in, 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 in the budget was to increase the, the allocation to uh, crime stoppers which I think, quite frankly, won't make a difference. If Crime Stoppers wasn't working with a million dollars reward, it's not going to work with $2.5 million reward. Because the issue is not the money, it's the credibility. So you could put $5 million. If I don't feel safe that my information going to Crime Stoppers is not going to get me killed, or it's not going to end up in the hands of corrupt police officers who warn the criminals, it's not going to make a difference. I think that money would have been better spent strengthening the, the, the investigative arms of the police service to ensure that the, the corrupt officers are weeded out. And one of the issues that Mr. Griffith also has to work on, and I see he's already started to work on, is the issue of the, the abhorrent HR practices oh, in, in the Toronto Bigger Police Service that have been allowed to flounder for decades. I see he's already started to deal with the issue of promotions, 
and, and rebuilding the self-esteem of, of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. And, and you, know, you know what Mr. Griffith provides more than anything else? And you know, let me thank Mr. Mr. Stephen Williams for his contribution. I know he got a, a lot of licks, but at the end of the day, he sacrificed and he saved this country to the best of his ability. But I put it on record plainly. I think Mr. Griffith is, as they say, Mr. Williams 5.0 upgrade. And Mr. Griffith provides leadership, which was sadly lacking in TNT Police Service. Visible leadership on the ground with his officers. Anything he wants them to do, he's willing to do it himself. I think that is very important. One, one of the other areas, Mr. Vice President, that I want to see uh, dealt with in terms of national security, and we all know this has been a, a pet peeve of mine for several months now, is the issue of prisons. And if we think that corrupt police officers damage the national security grid, I dare suggest that police officers occasionally come into the contact with hardened criminals. Prison officers, by the nature of their jobs, come into contact with hardened criminals on a daily basis. So the possibility of them becoming corrupted is much higher. And until and, where, and, 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 and until and when we decide we are going to deal with corrupt prison officers, we are going to be spinning top in mud. You know, Mr. Vice President, we have seen one of the issues the prison officers have, have had to deal with is the issue of the, 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 over the last, I think it's 10 years, 18 or so prison officers have been killed. Tragically, two in the last month alone. The criminal element is showing us without fail that they don't care. That if officers challenge them in terms of contraband, particularly in, in, in the Port of Spain prison, they will, there will be significant repercussions, including death. And one has to wonder how complicit are some corrupt officers in this trade of contraband that is putting their colleagues at risk. Because the telephones, the cell phones, and the flat screen TVs are not getting into the prisons just like that. They're not falling out of the sky. So I think significant emphasis needs to be placed on also weeding out corrupt prison officers. Because they are an extreme danger, not only to the, 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 their colleagues, but to every citizen in Trinidad and Tobago. And one of the issues we face in the prisons is the fact that there is no real accountability the 2015 prison break has not been brought to any level of re resolution. When an officer died, Port of Spain was shut down. Three inmates escaped, eventually killed. And to date, no resolution. And might I suggest, Mr. Vice President, that to deal with that, just like in the, in, in the police service, we look at the possibility of expanding the remit of the and changing the remit of the Police Complaints Authority to a, sec a Security Complaints Authority so that there is an independent body. And I don't see the need to duplicate a different agency if the, the Police Complaints Authority is already in training and in, in understanding what it takes to investigate um, allegations of corruption and misbehavior of police officers, it be widened to include prisons officers because of the significant levels of possible corruption involved in the prison service. Because expecting prisons officers to investigate themselves effectively is as foolhardy, Mr. Vice President, as expecting police officers to investigate themselves. And I took the opportunity and liberty to, to have a conversation with, with Mr. David West, the director of the PCA, about the possibility of this, and he doesn't see it being a conflict in any way once the legislation is amended to, to widen his remit legislatively to include the prisons. Because that prison situation needs to be dealt with. And if we don't, we will sadly see more and more prisons officers being killed in Trinidad and Tobago, gunned down in front of their homes. It is not going to end until we find the source of who is allowing the contraband into the prisons and who is compromising the national security grid in Trinidad and Tobago, because as I said before, Mr. Vice President, they 
the prison's officers come into daily contact with hardened criminals, increasing their likelihood of, in some instances, if they are so prone, to become corrupt. And we have to, to put different mechanisms in place to investigate corrupt and, 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 and identify and weed out corrupt prisons officers. Mr. Vice President, I think I have 10, 10, just under 10 minutes left, and eight minutes left. And there are two areas I want to get to. I will, it would be remiss of me not to deal with the issue of, of uh, education in Trinidad and Tobago. And I had quite a bit to say, but needless to say, what, one of the issues is that we, we really have to deal with our non-performing or underperforming students at the primary school level. And we seem to think that just migrating them up to secondary school, and by the way, our, our past grade in, 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 at, the prime, at the SEA level is 30%. 30% eh? pass grade means that you have, uh, you understand generally, that on a fundamental level, 30% of the, of the coursework. And if you migrate someone who has 30, 40, 50% up from primary to secondary school, you are transferring a challenge upward to teachers at a secondary school level who don't have the resources to deal with that. So there are about 2,500 students who score under 30%, who are migrated up. And the secondary school system is so already overburdened that those teachers and, 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 and counselors at that level do not have the training in, in many instances or the, or the resources to provide the interventions needed for those students. Not to mention about 800 students are missing or drop out between primary and secondary schools that we are not identifying where they're gone, where they've gone, and, and could be adding to a, a growing challenge in Trinidad and Tobago, where they become easy prey for gangs and other criminal elements in the country. And that needs to be addressed. We also have a situation, Mr. Vice President, where, again, and the Minister of Finance uh, identified uh, 1,424 or so, I, I, it's, it's around that number, uh, individuals receiving or registered to receive special need intervention. And I commend the government for the increase in disability grant, which, some in, 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 which includes uh, special needs. But when we think about in any jurisdiction, students or learners, as they're called, you have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, who have these challenges are usually between 12 and 15 percent of any population, special needs and or, or, or disability. If we take it down to 10 percent of our population, we generally have about 100,000, a little over 100,000 students who are actually have learning disabilities, special needs or disabilities. So if we have 1,400 or so registered and receiving grants, we realize how inadequate the subvention for that is. And even if it is 2,500, if anyone understands special needs in Trinidad and Tobago, you realize diagnostic tools, remediation, can cost anywhere in the vicinity of from three to $7,000 per child, per learner, per month. So that, while admirable in terms of the increase, is woefully inadequate. Mm -hmm. And our Education Act stipulates an education that increases the potential or, or develops the potential of every learner. I had the honor of, of, of again, attending the Down Syndrome Family Network uh, body walk yesterday between helping people get stuff for flooding victims and stuff. And when you see, and, and, and several special needs categories were represented, as is, as is the case every year. So congratulations to Mr. Glenn Niles and, uh, uh, for, for, for ensuring that it continues. We realize how much of a neglected sector this is in Trinidad and Tobago. And it makes no sense spending the largest portion of the budget uh, on, on education when such a large portion of, of the society, about 100,000, are not being met at their level and being provided the kind of support they need. And it is extra support. It is the difference between equity and equality. So they need more support. The other issue in my last two minutes, Mr. Vice President, which I can't get into, is the issue of uh, elderly people and commendations to the government for increasing the, the, uh, the NIS pensions. But we are heading into a dead end where that is concerned. And I wish I had more time to elucidate on that. But we really have to change our mindset to what that, uh, the Minister of, of, of Finance in opening the NIB's offices in, around the Queen's Park Savannah. 
touched on the fact that the, the, the system which was uh, created many, many years ago is projected to not be able to, to deal with, with the load by the year uh, 2030. And that's another, just like the petrotrin issue, is coming, and we want to get ahead of that. Finally, I think I have two minutes left, Mr. Vice President. One minute left. I am ambivalent on petrotrin because I think, although it may have been necessary, I think it so, has been so badly managed in terms of information and communication that that has exacerbated the situation. And my only suggestion, whether it's the right move or the wrong move, is that we don't end up in a situation like we did 55 years ago this year, where we shut down the train system and are paying for it today. I am not saying whether Petrotrain is right or wrong, but I certainly know that if we had the train system today, we wouldn't have the transportation issues, and we'd have saved billions of dollars worth of fuel. So I hope this has been well thought out, and in the future, moving forward, when significant decisions like that have to be made in Trinidad Tobago, there must be a cogent, strategic communication mechanism devised and not misinformation, inconsistent information, information coming from one hand to the next hand, and certainly not someone who is absent of emotional intelligence passing on information and denigrating the industrial court and or uh, the Industrial Relations Act in Trinidad by saying unions and the industrial court are almost irrelevant. I think that is counterproductive. And we need to have people who understand messaging and information to more effectively carry out those sorts of mandates. Because I know that there are other state enterprises, because Petrotrin is a case model for other non-effective state enterprises in Trinidad Tobago that must be addressed before they get to the stage of Petrotrin and be such a drain on the economy that it ends up compromising the very economy of Trinidad Tobago. So I agree with the move to make efficient and clean up state enterprises, but it must come with a clear understanding and a clear message to the population of what is to happen, why it is to happen, what is the way forward, what is to happen to those workers, and how will stakeholders be affected moving forward. And that has been terribly mismanaged in the case of Petrotrain, adding to the mistrust, and in some cases, exploitation by some forces in terms of continuing to add this ambiguity as to whether or not the Petrotrain issue is one that is worthy. Mr. Vice President, I thank you. Minister of Labor. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. I feel honored to be given the opportunity to contribute to this, the fourth debate on the annual budget. Mr. Vice President, I would first like to commend the Honorable Minister of Finance and the team at the Ministry of Finance, that, that team of hardworking public officers, and also the, minister, the Minister of Planning and Development and her team for a well thought out and expertly sculpted budget document. But Mr. Vice President, be, before I uh, share information with regards to the Ministry of Labor and Small Enterprise Development that I have the honor to lead, I would want to respond to certain statements made by my fellow Senator Khadija Mean that the um, with regards to their planned walk out of this house. Mr. Vice President, the national disaster that has been declared in this country by our honorable prime minister speaks volumes to what is taking place right now and has been over the past few days. None of us, Mr. Vice President, in this house and outside <laughs> of this house have escaped the pain and the trauma that this country and the citizens of this country ha have experienced. But you know, Mr. Vice President, all of us have been on our phones keeping track of what has been taking place, the numerous videos that have been planted on Facebook and elsewhere. But you know what we see coming through? Ordinary people, people helping people under adverse conditions. That is what we see. 
what we see is a people becoming unified. It didn't matter whether you, you are UNC, PNM, whether you are African, whether you are Indian, whether you are, you are Hindu, a Muslim, a Christian. All people were interested in is in helping those in need. I read, Mr. Vice President, uh, I think is um, La, La Hoquita, this resident who is affected himself admitted that he did not speak to his neighbor for eight years. Eight years, Mr. Vice President. But he set it aside because everybody was in need. And he turned wrong and helped that same neighbor. I saw videos where ordinary people with their pirogs out there helping to rescue others. Mr. Vice President, that is not unusual. We stay right here in our little square mile, our beloved country, and we see what is taking place internationally. And we see civic-minded citizens helping each other. My, my, my friend, Senator, I mean, if one was to have listened to her, apparently, she and the few of them there, the rest of the UNC, they, they alone responded and helped people. This is not about the politics. This is not about photo ops, jumping in a pirogue and holding a child and getting, getting a photo op. This is not about that. Mr. Vice President, uh, I mean, my, I am directly affected like anyone else here. My cousin, my very close first cousin, and his family, they live in Oropool. Mr. Vice President, none of us slept Friday night. None of us in the family slept. We were all concerned. His vehicle, when we saw the water, covered his vehicle, and then his phone died. So could you imagine? We, I know what people are experiencing out here. You can't sleep because you don't know what is happening. But in the final analysis, good people rallied around <coughs> and helped. <coughs> and in that context, Mr. Mr. Vice President, I would like to thank all the organizations, all the churches, all the village councils, all the NGOs, all the businessmen. I saw where um, a businessman bought hundreds of packaged food and distributed. We'd like, to, we'd like to thank all those private individuals who have given up their time, their money, their, their equipment. I mean, the doubles man source on his truck, did a video on asking people to distribute it. He was out there distributing free doubles and something to drink, Mr. Vice President. Everybody chipped in. This is not about who did much. Yes. With regards to the government, this government has mobilized its forces on the ground throughout the length and breadth. We have created a WhatsApp just to this flood relief. I mean, at the level of the party, our general secretary, others have been mobilizing. I mean, I spent all weekend mobilizing my own party group members into purchasing groceries, purchasing mops. I mean, we are all helping Mr. Vice President. And for the opposition to come here this morning, Mr. Vice President, in their very melodramatic fashion, and demanding that we shut down this debate. It is the same opposition, Mr. Vice President, who is demanding that the government set aside more than $25 million to help our citizens as flood relief. Mr. Vice President, if we were to act so recklessly and close down this debate, where will we get the money from to assist the citizens of this country? This house here has a responsibility to pass this budget so that funds could be identified to help those out there. That is reckless kind of politicking. And it, and it, it falls on us as usual to engage in responsible, in responsible activities, Mr. Mr. Vice President. So that, Mr. Vice President, we will sit here, we will continue to this debate, all of us, our heart, 
our heart bleed for our citizens out there who, I mean, Mr. Vice President, I don't know what it is to lose everything. I don't. But I have an idea what loss is. And my heart, like everybody else's heart in this chamber, go out to all those people. You know, you, could, you, could you imagine? They don't know. I was asking my husband, if we get flooded out, which room to start to clean? Which part of the house to start to clean? I mean, a simple decision like that brings on psychological trauma, Mr. Vice President. So instead of walking out, I want to encourage all of us to continue to help and to continue to pray. Because, Mr. Vice President, when everything else does not work, God is still in the miracle-making business. And we all have to praise and thank God that there has been no loss of life up to now. We praise and we glorify his name and we ask him to continue to show his mercies upon this country. Having said that, Mr. Vice President, I, I want to turn, I want to respond to two issues my fellow Senator Wade Mark made in his presentation. I mean, we have all grown accustomed to Senator Mark's sometimes outrageous statements that sometimes I wonder if those statements are made just to get mentioned in the newspapers. Senator Mark made two outrageous, inaccurate, unsubstantiated statements in this statements in this house last week. Firstly, Senator Mark alleged that this PNM administration closed down Arcelor Mittal. Now, I mean, Mr. Vice I President, it is not only reckless, irresponsible but patently untrue. And you know what is worrying? Senator Mark is aware that the entire country is aware of the ArcelorMittal situation, but he boldly gets up and places into this record a deliberate untruth. And therefore, it is my responsibility as a senator in this house, as a government minister, to correct that patently well, let me not say what I'm going to say. False, False statement. <laughs> Mr. Vice President, uh, Arcelor Mittal, responding to the collapse of uh, steel prices on the international market, made a decision that they were not making money through their plant in Trinidad and Tobago, and they took a business decision. And they decided to close up shop in this country. My concern as a former trade union leader in this country is that they left this country owing, not paying the ArcelorMittal workers mm -hmm. their separation, their retrenchment benefits. And therefore, Senator Mark ought not to engage in such untruths in this parliament. He's the leader of the opposition bench in, 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 this, in this Senate, and therefore we expect a higher level of responsible action and statements from him. Mr. Vice President, the second statement that Senator Mark made, Senator Mark alleged that it is the People's National Movement which is responsible for the increase in suicides in this country. You know, Mr. Mr. Vice President, this country comprises of very intelligent persons, eh? and they look, they look at the debates. They take in the debates. And I gather one such viewer um, writing felt strongly enough. And it's a view that I share, Mr. Vice President. Let me put it into the records. It is the Newsday newspaper of Sunday, October 21st, 2018, uh, page, uh, page 14. It's uh, a letter to the editor. And uh, the letter comes from one uh, Lynette Joseph. And she made a very powerful statement, an instructive, Mr. Mr. Vice President. I, I, I hope you will permit me to read into the records what she said. 
she said, the editor. The idea to place political blame for any increase in suicide statistics in Trinidad and Tobago on the People's National Movement is unpalatable, misguided, and just plain sick. Senator Wade Mark is not just representing himself. He represents a political party that has many supporters of Indian origin. In this little third world country where image is everything, Senator Ma can be alleged to be contributing to the idea that the UNC is bereft of sensitive hearing speakers. Senator Mark asks that we go to the United Nations website for verification regarding his accusation. Because, Mr. Vice President, when I asked Senator Mark, where did you get that information from? He said, go to the United Nations website and you will see what I'm talking about. So, clearly, Ms. Lynette Joseph took his advice. And she continues, Senator Mark is allegedly just digging at racial worms because the United Nations has records that show people of Indian descent are prone to committing suicide. Are we next to ask Senator Mark how many people of which race in our multiracial, multi multireligious, and multicultural society will allegedly possibly commit suicide if they join the unemployment statistics? Is he alleging talking about strength of character to survive hard times or just being silly? We live in a democracy where, luckily, anybody can say anything, regardless of how disgusting. The sitting opposition has an uphill task to win the 2020 elections that defy climbing Mount Everest. They do not need foot in mouth allegations from their leader in the Senate. All is fear in love and war and politics. Senator Mark's misguided allegation is yet another self inflicted <clears throat> coffin nail time bomb from the UNC for weekend in October 20th, 2018. History will record their pain in 2020. Mr. Vice <clears throat> President, Ms. Leonard Joseph has said it all, and I say no more on that. Mr. Vice President, I turn my attention to the budget of 2018-2019. Mr. Vice President, allow me to express my deepest gratitude and admiration for our esteemed Prime Minister, Dr. the Honorable Keith Christopher Rowley. Dr. Rowley has been the very definition of steadfastness, as he has anchored this great nation through tides and currents that have threatened to overcome us. His commitment to the rule of law, value for money, dignity in public office, and the growth of the nation has been the foundation upon which this administration was ably and firmly built. In fact, Mr. Vice President, Dr. Rowley's strength and confidence has been a personal source of inspiration, allowing me to face challenges with grace and courage. For that, I am truly grateful, and we are all grateful. Mr. Vice President, I turn my attention to challenging labor market. I have sat here and I have listened to the contributions of my colleagues. I've also listened to those who allege that this government is failing the people, that this government has put persons on the breadline, and that we do not care about workers and their families. But, Madam, but Mr. Vice President, I would like to state categorically that everything we have done has been for the well-being of the people of this great country called Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Vice President, I would dare say that this administration, we have refused to shy away from the difficult, the very, very difficult decisions that so many of the previous administrations, they choose to ignore because they were simply afraid they were simply thinking about winning election and not acting in the best interest 
of the citizenry of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Vice President, this administration has made the decision to put the needs of the people of Trinidad and Tobago and the future of our country above selfish politics and pecong. We have displayed through our Prime Minister strong and decisive leadership. He has led us with his determination and focusedness. We have had the fortitude to make necessary difficult decisions today in order to avoid being placed in a position where the decision is no longer ours to make. And what I'm simply saying, Mr. Vice President, the decisions that we are making is uh, in order to avoid the International Monetary Fund from coming into this country and then dictating to us what we should do. And worse, if we do not take certain decisions, we would have failed to, enjoy, to ensure the survivability of the next generation, Mr. Vice President. It cannot be denied, Mr. Vice President, the labor market in Trinidad and Tobago has been significantly impacted by the economic realities facing our country. It is important to note, however, that although the unemployment rate has been showing increases, <laughs> the overall rate is still very slow. Based on data from the Central Statistical Office, unemployment was reported at 5.1% in the third quarter of 2017, up from 4.0% in the third quarter of 2016. To put in that context, Madam President, according to the International Labour Organization in a press release dated December 18, 2017, the average rate of unemployment for Latin America and the Caribbean rose from 7.9% in 2016 to 8.4% at the end of 2017. The release also mentioned that unemployment in Latin America and the Caribbean increased for the third consecutive year, affecting more than 26 million people in 2017. Madam President, the challenging labor market is not confined to Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean region. The International Labor Organization, acronym ILO, in its World Employment and Social Outlook report of 2018, estimates that the global unemployment rate will fall slightly to 5.5% in 2018. That is 5.6% in 2017, marking the first turnaround after three years of rising unemployment rates. Madam President, with a great number of people entering the labor market seeking employment, the total number of unemployed is expected to remain stable in 2018 at above 192 million people. These are global statistics. In 2019, the global unemployment rate is expected to remain essentially unchanged, whereas the number of unemployed is projected to grow by 1.3 million. Madam Vice President, what is occurring in Trinidad and Tobago is not an unusual phenomenon. We are part of a global family, and whatever happens out there will impact on our small developing nation state. Madam President, these labor market conditions reach well beyond our shores and compound the already challenging 21st century workplace concerns which include rapidly advancing technologies, changes to the traditional profile of the workforce, and the move to create a diverse economy where emphasis is placed on skills, knowledge, innovation, and the sustainability of enterprise. Madam President, I want to take a little time to look at the question of minimum wage. On the topic of labor market conditions, Madam President, 
I heard it mentioned as a criticism by those on the other side that this administration has not increased the national minimum wage during our term in office. It was mentioned as though it's, it's a gift that you bestow on others. Madam President, the national minimum wage is not a political tool. It is not a sweetener to be used to win votes. I would like to stress, this administration does not believe in government by VAPs nor VOOPs. We believe in proper analysis and comprehensive plans and data-driven policy formulation. To this end, the Minimum Wages Board was reconstituted in 2017. This board, which is mandated, and that's a board that operates under the Ministry of Labor and Small Enterprise Development, this board is mandated to advise on all matters related to the fixing of minimum wages. They will be overseeing the conduct of a study in this fiscal year on the determination of the minimum wage in Trinidad and Tobago, including the development of an economic trick model that would make the process of establishing the minimum wage more scientific and on par with labor market conditions. Instead of a um, uh, 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 minister of labor, um, not me, getting up one morning and going to cabinet and saying, uh, we have election next month, you know, go be a good thing if we could raise, raise the minimum wage. No, Madam President. There is a scientific way of addressing how the minimum wage is arrived at. And we look forward to the results of this study and subsequent proposals from the Minimum Wages Board based on proper process and without any political interference. I know that this approach sounds alien to those on the other side who are accustomed to making uninformed but highly emotional and populist decisions. However, I am assured that the end result would be to the benefit of those who need it most. Madam President, the third around. Although in the past few years, labor market conditions have been challenging, this year we are clearly seeing a turnaround. And as I say that, Ms. Madam Vice President, I am reminded of a quote by President. Madam President. I'm reminded of a quote by, by uh, a woman for whom I have great admiration. Other people may have problems with her, but as they say, woman to woman. And I'm reminded of a quote by Miss Hillary Rodham Clinton, a former Secretary of the State and former First Lady of the United States. And she said this, and I quote, it is often when night looks darkest it is often before the fever breaks that no one senses the gathering momentum for change. When one feels that resurrection of hope in the midst of despair and apathy, close quotation. Madam President, I feel that hope. We all feel that hope now. The turnaround is upon us and the fever is breaking. The change we are witnessing fills me with a certain level of pride, because it is as a direct result of the strengths and talents that we have all been able to find within ourselves in facing the challenges of the past few years. Madam President, Strategic Plan 2017-2020, Ministry of Labor and Small Enterprise Development. As the saying goes, Madam President, necessity is the mother of invention. And we at the Ministry of Labor and Small Enterprise Development, we have found the capacity to invent. In January 2018, <coughs> the ministry officially launched its cabinet approved strategic plan 2017 to 2020. This homegrown plan represented the culmination of months of hard work by the diligent staff of the ministry. And it presents a roadmap which is guiding the transition of the ministry to a more proactive, customer-driven ministry. This strategic plan and its accompanying implementation plan 2017-2020, which will develop in line with the United Nations Sustainable Goals, the National Development Strategy 2020, 
2017 to 2030, or popularly known as Vision 2030, and the National Performance Framework 2017 to 2020 have guided the work of the Ministry over the past year and will continue to do so in the years to come. Madam President, this strategic plan is, is, is especially impressive for us at the Ministry because it was developed wholly by the staff of the Ministry. In its development, not only was there consultation with all members of staff, the teams comprising staff at various levels of the ministry, they provided their input on different areas, and a drafting team comprising ministry staff was responsible for putting the final document together. While significant emphasis was placed on the needs of our internal stakeholders, the opinions, views, and needs of our external stakeholders were also considered. And I feel a sense of pride, Madam President, that the Ministry of Labor did not have to go out on the external market and incur high levels of expenditure for a firm to come into the ministry and to develop our strategic plan. Our plan was developed bottom up and not top down. Madam President, what we have done is to create a roadmap for the achievement of the strategic goals of the ministry up to the year 2020, and through the alignment of these goals with Vision 2030. There's a tangible relationship between the work of the ministry and the developmental goals of this country. Each of the areas that I will now touch on are all identified as strategic actions in our strategic plan. And I turn my attention, Madam President, to labor legislation reform. Madam President, one of the promises made to the people of this nation in the run-up to the national elections of September 2015 was the conduct of a comprehensive review of all existing labor legislation in an attempt to foster a higher level of industrial relation practices in this country. This administration has remained committed to the ambitious project of reviewing and modernizing the entire labor legislative framework, recognizing that it is the linchpin of an effective industrial relations system. I've heard the criticisms, Madam President. I know that there are those who would want to lead the people to believe that we are not keeping our promise. But Madam President, it is important to remember that legislation takes time. The rule of law matters, and each and every word that we pro present in proposed legislation becomes uniquely important in its potential to fundamentally affect the very daily lives of our citizens. And therefore, we do not take that responsibility lightly, Madam President. A very critical part of the process, therefore, has been consultations with our partners, that is, government, labor, business, and other relevant stakeholders, including academia, international organizations, and experts in their respective areas. Might I add, Madam President, this consultative approach, which, which has defined our modus operandi, is diametrically opposed to that of the previous administration of no consultation. And we all remember, Madam President, the draft legislation that was placed before the parliament in, in 2014, which evoked widespread, widespread protestation from those who belong to the trade union movement. Madam President, we are the Ministry of Labor and Small Enterprise Development. We have identified 22 pieces of labor legislation requiring review. We place 11 of these as urgent legislative priorities for our current term, and we have been working diligently through our legislative agenda. From 2016 to present, Madam President, the ministry conducted 18 multipartite stakeholder consultations on 10 pieces of labor legislation. 
And if you would permit me to put into the records, Madam President, we began the consultative process mere months after this administration assumed office. So that in January 2016, our first consultation was on the Cooperative Societies Act. And those consultations were held on January 13th and 14, 2016 in Trinidad and January the 29th in Tobago, followed by the Industrial Relations Act on the February 22nd and 23rd in 2017 in Trinidad and April 8th in Tobago. Then the Retrenchment and Severance Benefit Act in May 2016. The Employment Standards Bill, that is legislation relating to certain basic terms and conditions, because we at the ministry hold the view that the time is ripe to ensure that every single citizen who goes into the job market seeking a job must enjoy certain basic terms and conditions of employment. And that will come under the Employment Standards Bill. Then the Friendly Societies Act in November 23, 2016, and January 24th and September 19, 2017. Next, there was the consultation on the review of the Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies Act. That was held January 25th, 2017. Next, we looked at the Occupational Safety and Health Act, March 21st and 22nd, 2017 in Trinidad, and July 10th, 11th in Tobago. And might I point out, Madam President, for every consultation we held in Trinidad, we held one in Tobago because we belong to a unitary state, Trinidad and Tobago. We also held a consultation on the Workmen's Compensation Act, the private security legislation, so that, Madam President, and we are still going. On July 27, 2018, we hosted a consultation on the Trade Union Act. We also conducted another round of consultation on the Employment Standards Bill, which looks at legislation dealing, as I said, with basic terms and conditions. In addition, on August 21st and 20, 23rd, sectoral consultations on specific occupational safety and health policies and regulations took place. Madam President, these are not all talk shops. Minister, we, you have five more minutes. These, these are serious issues. Out of the consultations and the engagement of a labor legislation reform project tripartite working group, four draft policy position papers would, were developed and placed before Cabinet. Cabinet has since agreed to the adoption of the national policy on cooperatives, and Cabinet further advised that the review of the Retrenchment and Severance Benefits Act and the Industrial Relations Act be referred to the National Tripartite Advisory Council for consideration. And I dare say the NTAC is close to closing off its discussion and submitting its views to Cabinet. Madam President, in fiscal 2018-2019, we intend to push even harder on the legislative agenda. The ministry will be placing focus on the Employment Exchange Act, the Recruitment of Workers Act, and the Foreign Labor Contract Act, as well as the Employment Standards Bill. So that, Madam President, we also looked at the developing a draft policy on sexual harassment, our 10-point plan my colleague uh, in the lower house uh, raised a question on the 10-point plan. It is in place. It is working, Madam President, so that all those persons who, unfortunately, if they lose their jobs for one reason or another, they are invited to register with the Ministry of Labor and Small Enterprise Development, at which time the 10-point plan would kick in. They would get counseling, financial advice. They register with our National Employment Service, and we match their resume with the needs of the employers who register with us, and we find alternative employment for them. So that, Madam President, in closing, I want to reiterate my wholehearted support for this finance bill before the House. I understand the constraints and the infinite 
needs which must be satisfied. So I am thankful for the generosity afforded to the Ministry of Labor and Small Enterprise Development this year. We have achieved so much with what we were given in the year gone. With the approval of this bill, we will keep doing more. We will continue to act with compassion, with grace, with courage, with fortitude, and we will relentlessly pursue our vision of decent work, industrial peace, and opportunity for all. Finally, Madam President, the turnaround we have longed for in Trinidad and Tobago is here. Yes, I urge my colleagues to get on board, support this plan, support this finance bill that is before the House. More than that, I invite my colleagues, in particular those on the opposition benches, who are calling for certain <laughs> funds to be placed elsewhere to support this bill. Madam President, I thank you. Senator Afool. Yeah. Senator Dial Singh, sorry. Thank you, Madam President, for giving me the opportunity to present on this um, debate here today. And I think with all this disaster we are seeing, we have to realize we are still a very blessed nation. We have seen the persons of all ethnicity, different religions, races coming together to try to rescue our citizens, to try and see somehow they can give some aid and assistance. Those are our unsung heroes. But we also have heroes existing from even before the flood. The flood was mentioned, we, we know the, the, the effects of the flood, but there are other heroes that we have in society, people who have been struggling to make ends meet, people who have been struggling to get to work, uh, facing transport issues, people who have sexual harassment at work, and I, the minister said it's a beautiful bill, that they, 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 a beautiful policy that is on board to help the sexual harassment. So these are people who are out there struggling, a single parent who may have problems, you know, uh, trying to manage food to her children. Again, we have the, 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 the school feeding program, which we must continue to prop up. There are persons out there who cannot even afford to feed their children. And this is something I'm, I'm saying that all how we should continue to make sure we have nutritious you know, elements in, in, in our foods to help our, our population. So we have, people are struggling, but we, ha we also see there are things in place you know, to help those persons struggling in their day-to-day -day living. So it's really the day-to-day -day beat up that the citizen we will say. They may come to me because 30 years in, in a, in a, as a family practitioner, also in the psychiatry, people will come and lay out their problems. Family issues, relationship issues, job-related stress, there's, there's workplace bullying now called desk rage, road rage, traveling to work. There's a whole host of problems day to deliver and, and crime. And when these persons have to deal with these, and then now you are dealing with natural disasters, earthquakes coming on, acts of God, then you have flooding coming on, it's, it's, it's a lot for people to bear. The psyche of the nation, I, I see people out there sometimes, you know, they come, they sit, they cry, they're exhausted. It's like they, they have to get it out of their chest, and they lay it out to me. And, and I'm, I'm happy to be here in this chamber to see how things run and work. And, and, and see how the sides will try to help, and sometimes try to, you know, give uh, suggestions how we can help our nation. Now, the persons who are struggling, the, 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 what I call the, the heroes, those persons out there, the citizens crying out for help. I, I think while the government has a duty to balance the budget, they also have a duty to ensure that the citizens are fed clothed, you know, sheltered, safe, you know, and I'm happy to see the increase in the food card grant, increase in public assistance, increase in disability grant, and even the increase cap to the, to the senior citizens, you know, pensions. These are much needed things, and I'm so grateful that those things are on board in this, in, in this um, budget. We have seen an economic growth of 1.9% for the first time in the last five years. To me, this is, again, an excellent, uh, you know, something that I feel proud that at least at Trinidadian, we're in, in, in dire straits, we're worrying about the economy, but we are seeing some positive things. We are seeing here also that the fact that the um, 
the expenditure, you know, um, you know, to try to bring down the expenditure, we see government brought down the expenditure, but again, they still have to catch up with their debts. Something worries me, though, is the Auditor General's report about the overdraft. This, again, still will show there's cause for concern. We have normal citizens crying out to me, too. They are looking at the economy and say, Doc, you know, we can't even get foreign exchange. We are struggling, you know, we want to purchase some things online. Why do we have to go out to, you know, you know, banks and, you know, treated, you know, with such a disrespect? Now, we understand in his wisdom, you know, the Minister of Finance may have to, to put those restrictions in, but we have to appreciate that the poor man may get the exception, the, the perception that there's only big companies maybe get in the foreign exchange, and the little man, the little businessman, may be somehow being shortchanged. So this is something I'm hoping that somehow the Minister of Finance could get this going to at least give some alleviation to the poor man who wants to order stuff, his, his goods. Are they talking about the impending closure or the closure of Petrotri now? What I realize now, the government has to make certain harsh decisions. The decision, you know, you know has even affected my fellow independent um, senator, Ram Kisun, who I felt hurt for her because here she is, she's going to lose her job. This, you know, so she's here in Senate giving her, her, her civic duty and she's going to lose her job. So I, I can empathize with her. When Metal closed its doors, we had workers who were depressed. We had also a worker who even killed himself. And um, I must say, the, the uh, Minister of Labor was aware of the facts that um, the closure of Metal, because uh, thankfully she had her PS meet with the PS in health, and I was part of the discussions. How could we help those persons who were, uh, you know, suddenly they, they they're not employed anymore? So suddenly Metal has gone. What do we do, do, do with those persons? And we had meetings, and the suggestion was, the suggestion I gave then was let the unions continue tracking the workers because the workers will go there and we have no way of, of capturing those workers to see who is going to get depressed. Also, if the company was still existing, but Mittal had gone, but if a company was still existing, let their employees assistance program continue tracking retrenched workers because those workers will be out there, lost to us, not coming to clinics, in the psychiatric clinics, but out there causing problems at home, sometimes go to alcohol, sometimes start to abuse their wives because it, it's a fact that unemployed, chronic unemployment leads to domestic violence, increases domestic violence. So the, the, the tracking of these persons out there was very important. And, and, and I was fortunate to be in the, the discussions I know, that your ministry had, and I'm hoping now that somehow those discussions could come into some sort of fruition, some sort of action plan. Because we, may, we have fancy books, we have fancy plans, but somehow we have to get those plans out there working for the people. And I think this is the challenge we have. This is a great challenge we have, because even all the plans that the uh, uh, minister mentioned about the sexual harassment, excellent policy. But we have to get it working in such a way that you know, we'll be able to now give some sort of ease to the, the women who have to go to work, mind their children, and being sexually harassed. So when, when Mittal closed its doors and we, we saw um, um, you know, what had happened there to some of the, the workers, we have to appreciate yeah, that unemployment does lead to depression. Unemployment, and even we looked at the, the, the suicide figures that um, uh, Honorable um, Senator Mark you know, suggested. Uh, he has some figures, but it's a fact that in Trinidad, we have the third highest suicide rate in the Caribbean. And we rank 41 out of 170 countries per 100,000 worldwide. So, so, so suicide is a serious issue in Trinidad. Now, it's not just economic um, downturn will lead to that. It is not just job loss. It is you may have depression in your family, so a genetic influence. You may also have, and we found it's also a lot of suicide is really linked to, to um, family issues, failed relationship. So a factor of unemployment is there, but is a multifactorial cause of depression. So therefore, when you look at depression, we have to realize any budget must take into account depression, suicide, 
the mental health of our, our, our persons. The Minister of Agriculture alluded to the fact that he was wondering if he was mad. I think he made some statements about that. Um, because, you know, and then we... <laughs> yes, I mean, he, yes, he was making a statement on that. But studies show that one in four persons will suffer from mental illness. So if we count here and we count the <laughs> adjunct staff and there are 40, 10 of us will be suffering from <laughs> mental illness. So I, I, well, I, ah, you see, so you will look that way and they will look that, that way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so so therefore, therefore, we have to appreciate mental health is very, very important to our nation. And, and, and in any budget, we have to appreciate that according to the EMBO report, which actually shows that the, the economic cost of mental disorders, right? That is the, the, the title of their report. It states that mental disorders account for more economic cost than chronic somatic disease, such as cancers and diabetes. So if we are discussing the budget, we have to realize if we have a depressed society and they are continuing going into depression, it will be a great economic burden to our, uh, our society. In terms of lack of working hours, in terms of not being able to care for a family, you know, in terms of the cost, because some of those medications for depression are very expensive. Thankfully, we have it available at our health centers, our psychiatric health centers now. Expensive medication. So thank God it's there. So the, there is the, 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 the cause of disability of depression we have to take into account. And young people, you know, at this year, we had the World Health Organization, um, you know, they, they had October the 10th, 2018. World Health Organization celebrated it, another organization, but that is always earmarked as, as the World Mental Health Day. And this year, it was actually, the team was young people and mental health in a changing world. And I was again fortunate to, to work with the Ministry of Health. We had some exhibitions at Brian Lara Promenade, and the message is to go out there and tell people depression is real, and you have to capture the people who are depressed and bring them each for treatment. Because the challenge is we are not getting persons who are depressed to come to us. 60% of persons who suffer from depression will never seek help. So there's a whole host of persons out there, our citizens, our relatives, and maybe they're our neighbors, depression, and they're not coming. The stigma of mental health prevents them from coming to us. And what WHO recognized this year, having the team for young persons, is half of all mental illness begins by the age of 14. And suicide is the second leading cause of death among 15 to 29 year olds. Now, think about it. If you have a son, a daughter, a nephew, a niece, this figure is startling. 15 to 29 year old suicide is the second highest cause of death amongst that population. So therefore, we have to beware. One of our nieces or nephews, sons and daughters may not be with us to adult, adulthood. And this is a fact that globally, world, the World Health Organization has realized that. So therefore, the millennial generation, we thought we spoiled them, and they didn't know how to fit into the real world. Now we are faced with an iGen, which is the younger generation, very good at multitasking in, in, in their phones, their computers, television, everything they can do at once. But they lack their social skills. They lack the ability to handle stress. And that generation is the generation I'm worried about. And that generation worldwide, uh, psychiatrists and, 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 and mental health caregivers are, is worried, are worried about. And so should we. We should be now factoring in the place what's going to happen to that generation if their second option, if they fail an exam or a relationship go bad, second option is kill myself. There's no plan B and C and D. Plan B is kill myself. And this is what we have to look out, the issue of children. And so I would now like to carry uh, this debate into children. What I'd like to look at is the educational system and the children. So we're looking at the educational system and the children, where what I think is when you look at the education of children, I get complaints every year. SEA exams, the stress of SEA exams. Mothers are anxious, children may be vomiting before the exams. Then we have the CXE exams. Children have to go and, and take extra lessons. So what we have here is a situation whereby we know what is stressing out our children. Now, if a child is stressed out because the home situation is such, 
the social worker could capture that. If a child is stressed out because their own genetics make them predisposed to depression, again, we will have to catch that. But if the educational system is further abusing our children, this is what we now will have to change it. Now, we may have to say, we grew up like this, but no, the world is changing. I never knew people kill themselves in my time when they were my age, as a student. Now, children are killing themselves. So we have to see, what could we change? We can change the educational system that may be abusing our children. And it goes right up, because two medical students kill themselves within the last two years. So it goes from childhood right up. So we have to appreciate this, and we have to put things in place, because we'll be losing our individuals. So they, they, we, we look at childhood and, and the system, and we looked at even trying to identify these, these, the, these children. So part of my suggestion in this budget is the, the money spent to education should help, in a way, identify troubled children. So how do we identify troubled children? Children may come in school, I say give them one, two, two three terms to settle in. If they are not settling, we have to see what's wrong with that child. Does that child have attention deficit this, uh, um, hyperactivity disorder? 6.5 million in the states, children have this disorder. Does the child have dyslexia, where you are teaching a child uh, A, B, C, and in their mind, there's nothing in that child's mind it will register at A, B, C, it will register differently. So it cannot register in that child's mind as what a teacher will be trying to say. So children who have these developmental orders, they may disrupt the class. They may be labeled as violent, but they just cannot learn. So we have to now identify these children from early, see how we can uh, uh, deal with them, and I am calling for the the reintroduction of the special ed teachers. We need that. It was, it, was a, it was a brilliant thing that it would actually give the teachers a little free up. It will help the parents to know that their child could still fit in in the mainstream schools and will be able to you know, have that, that understanding from the other members there that, hey, there are people who are differently abled also. So the special ed teachers is something that I'm hoping could be factored back in to, to the budget. So special ed teachers like that, I have to commend the government for giving the grants for the special children. This is, this is something that is, uh, is, is, is needed, but it's much more. As my colleague here was saying, the cost to carry those children to, 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 to learn, it, 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 it's humongous. It, it's difficult for a, a single working mother to carry a child to learn little skills in for autistic child, for cerebral palsy child. So we need to somehow give those grants a little, you know, a, a bigger grant to that. Again, we look at, at, at children. So if, if, if there's a child, if, if, if we are looking at children in school, we have to learn how could we identify a troubled child. First term, let a child settle in. Second term, let a child second. By the third term, if, and because children learn to socialize with one another, so they are look, learning socialization skills. By the third term, if they are not settling, we have to have little red flags up. We have to have the student support services come in now and say, how could we assess that child? Is it something going on in the child's home? Social workers will have to go after that. Is it something with the child that a developmental disorder, which is an ingrained thing that you know, needs more challenging to, to fix, and the, the special ed teachers will, will, will be able to help that. Um, along with the support of the student uh, support services. So the student support services in this country needs to be increased in funding, staff, it, it definitely it needs that. So this is something we have no choice because we know children uh, are going to be depressed. We have to increase funding along that lines. I would also suggest that we now try to introduce, since we know children are going to be depressed and suicidal, in, in, in a big way, Let's learn, let us now introduce something in the schools called a depression rating scales. We can have scales where we can monitor children as they get older, and those scales actually have questions that you could know if a child has anxiety or depressive illness, and we can now factor how could we help that child. Now, a lot, a lot of these children, eh, we, we found that Daphne Phillips, who graced this, this chamber sometime in the past, she did a study where they looked at violent children, children who are violent in, in the schools. And, and when they actually did that study, the, the stress level of those kids, 40% said they were sexually abused, 30% uh, poverty, 15% physical abuse, 10% neglect, 5% verbal abuse. So if you're cursing your child and telling your child you're ignorant, you know, you know, that child will obviously have some level of stress. 
And thankfully, the Ministry of Social Development has parenting classes and the development of policy. So things are being developed, so we have to be thankful about that. So Daphne Philip, um, study showed us that if we see a violent child in school, we can't judge that child. That child might be a child crying out for help. That child might be in being sexually abused at home. So I, I thank God that we have the Children's Authority on board, and I also have to thank the government for giving us an increasing, you know, increasing penalties under the Children's Act, because we are seeing children being abused, we are seeing our children are suffering. So we need, again, to fund the Children's Authority better. We need to have homes that we can rescue children, put them in safe places of love where we can rescue them and carry them there, away from homes if we cannot fix those homes, that we can have um, homes developed where we can hire retired principals, retired teachers, retired mental health officers, show those children love, give them attention. And those children, even if they are abused, they can blossom out into the most productive individuals. I, I, I tell my children, look at Oprah Winfield. At the age of 15, she was pregnant, raped by her uncle, and she, be, she is one of the most successful women in America. Yes, and, yes and, and the thing is, because her father took her and gave her that support after when, when she was pregnant, she got read by her uncle. It, it's a horrendous story if you read her lifestyle. So children can be rescued. It's our duty to rescue them. And, and, and looking, and if I always say there was an ex-DPP, Alric Benjamin, he was from St. Mary's home. So you have success stories even within Trinidad that we could look at. But, you know, some of those homes are... You know, we had some bad reports from some of the, the homes before. So whatever we are putting into place, we have to monitor carefully. The right staff, no sort of pedophiles are there because statistics show these people may gravitate to these homes. But we have to have homes where I, I'm, I have plenty of retired people, nurses, teachers, who said they are willing just for stipend just provide transport. They are willing to come on board to give off their love, to give off their teachings, because they are bored home. And if we could have that system in place where we could take them to interact with these children in the homes, we'll be doing a service both ways, for those retirees and also for the children. Um, again, children need playtime. And my suggestion have always been, the last hour of school, just put it at playtime. Let the children run, scream you know, whatever, let them just play, but under guidance. Let, hi, let us hire some OGT personnel, and the OGT personnel will one job. So hire them. So the teachers are, 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 they could be in their staff room, but the OGT personnel are looking at these kids playing, how they interact, how they socialize. And if you see somebody withdrawn, or somebody abnormally aggressive, student support services can come on. So we can now capture our children who may be adults who will be dysfunctional, who may be children who really need help from what's going on in the home. And so we screening skills and suggestions like this, I think we can, we can help here. But you see, it hurt me to see, you know, we have such a, uh, the educational system, but it really hurt me to see the scenario recently in the University of the West Indies where there was the, 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 the rockers with the police and the, and the students. And you know, I was so proud just recently when the University, University of the West Indies was ranked in the top 5% universities in the world. This is something made me proud of for Trinidadian. And, and, and for those who went to the University of the West Indies and Augustine, I'm sure you are proud. But I'm three times as proud because I went to Cave Hill and Barbados for a year. And then I studied medicine four years in, in, in Moda and then in St. Augustine for a year. So I, I was actually fortunate to see the best of the whole Caribbean and the best of the University of the West Indies. And I'm thinking, well, I, say, I have a colleague right now. He was so, he's so proud. He says, you know, I, I went to Oxford. I can tell him now, hey, I went to the University of the West Indies because we are among the top 5% in, in the world. What we need to do, though, is we need to look at this to see if we can now capture a market out there to come for, for educational tourism. Because if we are among the, 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 the top 5%, somehow we have to tap into that market now. We have to say, come here and study in the University of the West Indies. We are going to look, we are among the top 5%. You will feel good after you come from this university. So we have to tap into that market, educational tourism. Medical students have come to our uh, medical show, so we now have to go widespread with that. But you see, what may prevent people from coming here is crime. We have to appreciate that. What may prevent? So on, on it, on touching on educational or edu, educational tourism, we also have to look at the fact that 
the Brian Lara Stadium was fixed recently, and we had the games there, the 2020 games. But then again, you know, I met a, a British national recently, and he said, you know, if he had, if Trinidad was safer, he would have allowed children to come, he's a school teacher, from Britain to Trinidad to learn under the master. So we have sports tourism waiting here. When it's winter in England and, and it's cool and they want to get away from that, come to sunny Trinidad, learn after the master. Brian Lara's name in London evokes such emotion to people. When you see that, you realize they would come here if we give them an opportunity to say, we are giving you a safe environment, sporting academy. You learn under the master, Dwight York. The, 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 in, in football, when you, when you hear his name sometimes among the persons in Europe who love football, these are people who are respected outside, and we have to utilize that in sports tourism. Kishon should be teaching people how to throw the javelin here. So 2020 matches again could be a fixture to our shores, could give us that level, but I think we can go more, and we have to market our sporting heroes and market it in such a way that people will want to come down here. Now, again, tourism. We have to stimulate the economy in such a way because with, 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 with the hard times. But I always wonder why tourism failed because uh, Trinidad had, Tobago especially, was such a beautiful destination. But now we find people rather go Grenada, they rather go St. Lucia. So we have to get back the persons to come to Tobago. I don't know if Sandals is the answer because the Magdalena Grant was there. We saw it was sold from, you know, it was bought over from Hilton. And we, the money pumped into it with all the same talk that, hey, we are putting money into this hotel and it's going to boost tourism. It never materialized. So are we going to see the same thing with Sandals? I don't know, but I guess Sandals may stimulate the Tobago economy by providing jobs. So I'm seeing an effect there. But again, will it in the long run bring tourists to our nation? I'm not too sure. We have in Trinidad so much festivities, the Wali, um, Pagua. We have, you know, you know, emancipation there where you can get the African diaspora, they, they, they wear, they eat, they, they, their meals, everything there. We have to market Trinidad as, as, as a, a, a nation of fest, you know, festivals where you can come in. But again, crime is, is the issue. So let us see if crime is the issue. How are we going to? to help the situation with crime. And this, I think, is a challenge facing all of us, a major challenge facing all of us. And I, 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 my colleague mentioned the, the appointment of the COP, the COP, um, Commissioner of Police, um, which is, to me, a brilliant thing that was done by your government. Because for years, we were wondering why you know, persons couldn't just appoint a Commissioner of Police. That gave us a level of of you know that things are being done that gives us a level that that hey there's somebody new on the block somebody who's not a police officer also so i think somehow that gave a positive vibes what was done and people missed out that we also got a rare admiral hidden Pichard. we have a rare admiral we didn't have one for years kelshall was the last one so our borders by choosing people and putting people in positions what 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 you all have been showing people Probably our borders may be now when they were locking down. So again, two appointments, I think, was very important. Listen to the Minister of um, National Security. Um, you know, we, we heard the talk about upgrading the fire services, and we, need, we saw for the flood, we really need an upgrade for the fire services. Um, the uh, fact that good things happened, because we saw the automated immigration machines at the airport. So we now look in first world. When you come in there and you can go to those automated machines, it is something that can help you know, get through customs quicker, especially if you have little children. It, it, it's some, so those things are happening, and those things we should be proud of. The prison officers, I think the greatest threat to prison officers is a fellow prison officer. We know that. So, so that pris prison officer uh, uh, situation, uh, it's it, 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 it's regrettable that you know you're putting your own um, colleague at risk, but you're willing to do these things. Now, I have always said there has to be raids in the uh, in, in the prisons. But how are you going to do these raids? You have to have persons from the interagency task force just coming in there, wear masks, and go in there and raid the prison. 
spot raids. So you're not even telling the police officer, the prison officers. You just go in there and make raids. And, and, and somehow, when you get those prison officers who, is on, who are on duty, who somehow you see things are getting in there, you take full bond of the law, take full action on these persons. So you have the, 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 the point of CCT cameras. And this is something that I think I was always disappointed about. We have these cameras all over Trinidad. Yet still, we see crimes are committed, and we are not able to track the criminals, are not able to apprehend the criminals. P um, people's car got, uh, you know, are getting stolen in Trin City Mall. The car is on the highway. They are calling. How could we track that? And I think this is a challenge that um, we need to try to see how we could work with the, you know, the government, the population, civic society, to see how we could get those cameras going. Plus, how could we get the cameras in such a way with all the privacy issue being uh, affected? If a crime is committed, I should be able to get access to that camera. Those crimes or, or whoever criminals going on the highway, driving in every area, those shots of those could be in all the billboards that we see there, the electronic billboards, all in our WhatsApp group. So there's an easy way to get those, crim the, those CCT cameras working and to let it help the population. We now, we, 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 we say we're in the jaws of the, 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 the Chinese in terms of debt and all the money they have. They're coming in here, they're going to look at the, the harbor, they're going to do some things. And I'm thinking we could probably ask China also to help us set up their uh, secure, the, the camera system because they have something called a, uh, a camera system there, similar to the one that exists in London, but their own is far superior every street. They can track someone. They can see somebody in a crowd, and they can have a tracking of that individual and who, who that individual is. So people may look at privacy issues. People may look at, at, at the issues of, 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 of um, you know, it being in the hands of people could track certain individuals. But I'm saying if we are dealing with criminals now, we have to put things in place where, uh, you know, we can have things there. We can apprehend these, these, these these criminals. I, I welcome the National Fusion Center that the minister spoke about. And I also um, you know, hope that we get some sort of relief with this. And again, something I want to commend the government on, the fact that they want to bring the tasers, pepper spray, rubber bullets. When they killed two mentally ill patients within the last five years, I was asked to comment on it. And I'm saying to apprehend a mentally ill patient, police officers may not know how to do it. They may have to have a team involved with mental health officers and mental health, and this is going to get worse. So this problem is going to increase where police officers will be having to interact with mentally ill persons. So therefore, the tasers, pepper spray, rubber bullets could help save their lives. So that is an excellent suggestion. Now, we have to fix crime. If the commissioner of police said that a cartel exists in the police service, then for me to see something being done about crime, I would like to see that the police services is, is cleaned up a bit. I would like to see something is being done there. We always knew that the police service had rotten eggs. The late Prime Minister Patrick Manning brought in the Scotland Yard. Then we have the, uh, the ex-Prime Minister um, Kamala Passad Bissessa tried with the Canadian police. And you, you know, we have now a situation where if there's a cartel existing, my suggestion is bring in the DEA, ask the DEA to come and assist us. Because you see, if we continue like this, I, I, I don't know where the relief will be for citizens. I also suggest that police officers and prison officers declare their assets to the Integrity Commission. Because you just, you know, do you, do you are uncertain? We have to look at the laws for that. How could they declare their assets to the Integrity Commission? Because we know there may be corrupt officers out there, and we have to have some way of trying to, to clue in on them. So uh, the, the, the fact of, of, of drugs in the country, and I'm suggesting the DEA, because you see, it is frustrating to doctors in St. Anne's Hospital and other hospitals to so bring in people who are on the streets, the sprangers that you call them, the drug addicts, bring them into St. Anne's, you detoxify them, get the drugs out of the system. They do not want to go to the free government service that is offered. Cora is a free rehab center. 
And the majority of those people we treat for drugs, they don't want to go. It's a voluntary system. So how could we now, you know, solve this? We call it a revolving door admission because if we know we're going to see the same chap uh, um, come three, three months down the line. But society is fed up of these pangers jumping on their walls, stealing their hoses, uh, interfering, you know, you know, digging up in the garbage. We, as a, we have to produce something to help. Be it a law where we could now, we could now have you know the the the, the um, legal service create a law where we can take somebody with drugs, put them in a rehab forcefully, and say you have to stay there for a year. It will give some sort of social ease to the population outside who are fed up with them, and even the families who cannot force them into treatment. So we have to get that law where we could take them into some sort of rehab, planning, yoga, but. Whatever we do, we will be given some level of ease to the population who have to deal with those people outside. Plus, we'll be drying up the market for those persons who sell these drugs. Looking at the agricultural sector, I, I was pleased when I heard um, you know, your presentation, Mr. Singh. And I, again, we realize Senator, that the Senator. fifth... Senator Diaz, you have five more minutes. Okay, sure. Fifteen percent um, um, last year. You know, we, we saw that um, those mega farms in the past. What happened to them? You know, we had grandiose plans. Good news about the subsidies, but we need again to encourage the grow box and the aqua aqua farming to ordinary persons who can do it. We need to encourage that to a greater extent. We also have to factor in the damage to the environment caused by gramoxone. Being in the medical profession, I had called for gramoxone ban years ago because this is when it's used for suicide, it's, it's fatal. So somehow we have to look at safer measures. We have to look at, at, at some good things that are being done in agriculture. Again, the, the farmer's market and even the, 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 you know, there's the farmer's courses that are being done. Looking at Ministry of Health, we are still challenged with staff shortages, infrastructure uh, needs to be fixing. Again, with this current um, uh, flood, we lacked something called psychological first aid, where we should have had persons at each shelter dealing with that, because we are going to have a fallout from this, this, um, um, this flood. We are going to have post-traumatic stress, I could foresee it. Good news, we are opening health centers for 24 hours. Great news, the HPV vaccine is offered from the government free of charge. And this vaccine could potentially um, get rid of cancer of the cervix in the next 30 years if we aggressively pursue these vaccines. Alcohol is something I, I, I think we have to look, and we look at alcohol because the WHO, um, WHO report 2018, September 21st, said that, that you know, 3 million people die from harmful alcohol use. And we are one of the five countries, we are ranked as one of the five countries with the highest rates of, of harmful alcohol consumption in the Americas. Yeah. So therefore, I think we need to realize we should raise the purchase age of alcohol to 21. The America has it. Their voting age is 18, but purchase age is 21. We may have to look at that somehow and consider this. But the Ministry of Health is now, they have an alcohol policy. So we have to look at that policy. Um, gambling is something I think it's uh, ill, but you know, because we are losing. Uh, there's gambling machines in all the rum shops now. There are gambling machines in restaurants, any little parlors. And, but there's the Gambling Act coming up soon. Ministry of Health has helped with community of health disease, maternal mortality. We are conquering that. Hardly any maternal deaths are claimed, so that's a, 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 big, a big up for that. The fact that soft, soft drinks in school is a no-no, again, beautiful things are happening there. Uh, Senator Lee Hunt um, mentioned about the, the fact that the, the lines, the water lines need repairing. But put into place something for the citizens where I can call and get truck borne um, water. Put into place something for the citizens where you can give me a tank Give me a tank. That should be a drive. Um, you know, give thanks to people who can't even afford, but have a good truck borne water supply system to give some relief. Uh, life expectancy is increasing. We are 17.5% 17, of the population will be over 60 years soon. So therefore, we are aging population. So we have to take into account that, hey, um, you politicians, this is a voting block. You know, if it's a voting block for you, that may motivate popul um, to, to do something for this elderly population. Because we have old, old ladies home, husbands have died and their children have, have moved on, emptiness syndrome, they're depressed. 
we have to have policies in place, and there's a great policy directive from the Director of Aging in the Social Development. We need to prop up uh, uh, Dr. Jennifer Rouse with her policies, and we need to get things for our aging population. So as I end, I want to say that this flood, I saw citizens banding together, and I felt proud that in times of crisis, they can come together. In 1952, there was an experiment, a psychological experiment called Robber's Cave Experiment, where Dr. Muzaffar Sharif got groups of children together in a camp, and he actually caused them to have conflict. But afterwards, when he put them to do a common goal, like a fallen tree in, the, in, in, in blocking the entrance to, or to push a lorry, those children who had that conflict and that disparity and that disagreement, the 12-year-old kids, 11 here and 11 there, were able to work together. And that experiment showed, it's, it's called the realistic conflict theory, but what it showed is at times of crisis, people can work together. So therefore, that experiment, I think, you know, in conclusion, I think we have a lot of the unsung heroes that we saw coming out in crime. And I think, um, thank you, <laughs> okay, well, five, okay, okay, uh, yeah. A lot of unsung heroes coming, coming, you know, coming out and assisting people of all, yes. I apologize, but your time is, is up. Yeah. Um, honorable senators, permit me on your behalf and on my behalf to commend Senator Dial Singh on his meeting conference. Honorable Senators, at this juncture, we will suspend for lunch, and we will, re and we will return at five minutes past two. <laughs>